Since you both brought up tutorials with the hand-on sessions, um, well, why hand-on tutorial on Proto? Well, um, for most people on the list, when we speak about, oh, you should do this with Proto, uh, the reaction is often, what? Okay, because when you look at the documentation or even what is already done with Proto, it's quite an impressive mass of code to get it through for many reasons. First, uh, Having to build uh, tools using Proto is not uh, trivial because there is a lot of stuff we have to unlearn and learn new. And so, well, the implementation is of Proto is not something you can hack around and say, oh yeah, now I get how it works. So uh, Eric uh, Nieber did a very nice talk last year about what's going on in Proto and how you can actually make stuff that uh, makes sense as you know uh, libraries or library interface. Uh, and I think it was quite uh, welcome. And so the idea this year was to get a bit further than that and say to people, okay, we will get over the basic again so you can get your mark on what's going on and what's the fundamentals of Proto. And actually at some point say, okay, now you have to jump into and work on a simple example so you can actually wait through the relevant part of the documentation with some apps, see how the stuff can be actually uh, structured and uh, handled in different ways. To see how we can actually make something, well, in a bit less than we are now, and see how it works. So the idea is basically to, yeah, going through on the basics of Proto and see what's kind of going, going on. And the idea is to say, yeah, we get a simple exam, so, which is really simple and in terms of uh, what's going on in the uh, non-Proto parts, but which can, of, you know, um, go over every uh, interesting part of the library and how it can be applied. And the idea is to well, get home with something that you can actually look around and say, yeah, now I understand how it works. So the idea is to get something uh, which is rather trivial. So the idea is to actually um, upgrade one of the product tutorials which is in the doc, which is a simple calculator. And the idea is to turn this into some kind of uh, domain-specific language to build uh, multiple variables, analytical functions, uh, with very few operators, like for and couple functions, and see how we can actually evaluate values of true these things, we can have a look uh, at what the kind of code is generated, and we will see that with not that much effort, we can have something which is rather uh, happening as a result, so we will see how we can take this analytical function, the DSL, and write basically something that helps us calculate, compute the analytical derivative of the functions, and we will see that with basically nothing, we will have partial derivatives and multiple derivatives for basically nothing. And we will see that it's basically something that, well, a couple of, uh, well, maybe 50 or 60 lines, which are actually really readable when you look at them afterwards, and which is actually something that you can understand when you look at the code, which is one of the important parts of Proto. So basically, uh, <clears throat> there's supposed to be a website where uh, you can grab a, a zip file with uh, everything in it. Uh, you should get some boost release, so as I say uh, a bit later, a bit earlier, it either works with the latest release or the trunk. It should work with anything up to 144. I don't think it works before because there is a huge uh, breaking change in Proto at this point. Get compiler, okay, and we will start by the introduction where you we will just look around the basic uh, ideas around Proto and what's going on, and afterward we have two steps where you will have actually to uh, walk on your own, I will go around and help people if needed, and we will piece by piece try to implement these uh, small examples and see uh, how it works. For each step, uh, you have a solution folder in the same place, so if you are getting stuck or you can make hello tales of uh, the stuff I say, because I know well. Uh, can we have it on this side? Yeah. <laughs> There it is. Sometimes, I know sometimes I speak stuff and nobody understands. <coughs> so you can look at the solution files and try to get past what's um, actually uh, blocking. Uh, I try to make it very progressive. Um, so you should be able to uh, walk around on your own. Uh, if something starts to come to the area because I forgot there is some bigger gap than I, I thought first, uh, don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand and we will go slowly on the path that cause you problem. So, uh, I will wait for everybody maybe to get the files, uh, but I can start with the introduction stuff. Uh, and starting by the first file is actually a great idea. Yeah, can I get something? 
Don't tell me there is only stuff I don't have a food to bring you. Yeah, of course not. Okay. Um, you need to use the Emacs then. Oh, yeah, I know, but well. I'm, I'm still getting used to that for something I will show you later. Eclipse has this wonderful feature that you can over over a boost macro and it expands it in the over text, which is rather nice to debug for boost preprocessor stuff. It's called control C, control E. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I would hide in the corner. So, okay, people with Emacs use Emacs. <laughs> Whatever. So, um, okay, you can come in. I just started. Right? Uh, what, what are you looking for? The XML stuff is over there. The what stuff? XML is next. We're here. Ah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, there is a few slots over there. There's one here. So, uh, uh, what are we trying to do? Okay, so uh, the basic idea of Proto is actually giving a high-level framework for uh, building expression template-based code. So expression templates, I think, um, the last part people here know about, uh, is techniques that allow us to basically have some kind of emulation of lazy evaluation in C++. Well, what? Yeah. Uh, and that is the idea of lazy evaluation with the extra template is the following one. Uh, instead of having a, a subset of... You're too far over the camera. Ah, okay. There it's okay. <laughs> I'm not used yet. Yeah, oh, anyway. So, the basic idea is the following one. Uh, instead of having a bunch of classes and entities that represent some uh, complex systems and operators and functions that operate on these entities, by actually creating new value from the old one, uh, the principle of expression template is actually to capture the your structures of the expressions built using this function and these operators. And these structures that basically looks like a flattened view of an abstract syntax tree will contain all this static information about the structure of the expression, the tree structure, and some other information that will basically be, okay, where are stored the runtime value in this abstract syntax tree, and how can I get to them when I need them? There's a lot of stuff that we have done with uh, expression template back in the day, and the main, the main problem was that every time you need a new uh, expression template based code, you basically had to rewrite all the machinery to capture the expressions, store the values, and get some exp uh, introspection or manipulation on the tree. And what Proto proposed is that a way to basically go all over these details and concentrate on the interesting parts of an expression template library design, which is what are the operations that I do on my entities and what are the transformations I can do on those uh, abstract syntax tree before actually generating with code so we can get the simplest stuff, which is having no tem uh, temporary value between operators of function call, which is, I mean, the basic stuff we can get, and by being able actually to analyze tree and modify it at copy time, Basically, be able to have some kind of, I will pick big quotes around what I would say, some kind of compile time based uh, compiler inside the compiler. Where the input is basically this, we will see later, huge, ugly tree like types. And it will turn into another set of types, more or less complex, that will be basically uh, used to generate smaller, simpler code in a way, basically, the way we want. So, the basic uh, element in these systems is a way to basically say, okay, I have an entity and I want that any operator calls or function calls I operate on this entity uh, generate the start, the seed of a lazy tree. So the base element in Proto is basically able to be defined new types and new instances of these types that act as what we call there the seed of the tree, which is basically something that would say, okay, now as from now, every stuff you apply on this will generate a lazy node in a new IST, and you will can carry on with this because all the ISTs themselves, when operated over, will generate a bigger IST in a lazy fashion. And as you chain operators and function call on these lazy types, you will grow a tree uh, in whatever way you want, depending on what you are trying to do. And what does Proto say is that, okay, we have these types for building so we have this type which is called boost proto terminal, which basically says what it means. It's a terminal leaf of the tree, 
Let's say, okay, I'm a terminal type, and what do I uh, hold inside myself is something of these types. Okay, so we have variable tag there, which is a simple struct for now, doesn't do anything. And, well, I'm making a, a constant instance of this uh, terminal type, which I call underscore x. Okay, and which is initialized with some funky uh, aggregate pod initialization using bracket, uh, curly braces. And this type is basically something that is a, a prototype, that, a prototype, sorry, which is basically a type that has overloads for all the possible C++ operators overloaded to generate new nodes in an abstract syntax tree. And any, every time you will apply whatever on this instance, you will grow through. So basically, this is the very beginning uh, of our DSL. We have something that say, okay, X is something that holds a variable, we'll see later what's going on. And every time I use something on this, I will grow a lazy tree. Okay, you basically, with these two lines, you have basically made your first proto-program. You see, it wasn't that hard. And how does it work? Well, magically, as terminal just overload whatever operator exists, well, you can build stuff like this. Doesn't make any things. So you can, yeah, modulo assign something to x, which is x plus 3 times the complement of x shifted by 6 on the other side. Doesn't mean anything right now. And we basically will look into this stuff using display x, that's something we will use quite a lot during this tutorial, will basically give us a um, representation as a readable uh, string of what's going on in this stuff. So it's quite a nice debug facilities. So this will compile without anything else, because terminal basically overloads all of this. It basically overloads all the operators you can have. Parentheses, brackets, comma, assignment, whatever, and even funky stuff like, uh, what's the name of this stuff? Uh, pointer member accessors, whatever, okay? The graded uh, arrow star stuff. So what does it do when you compile this? So where is my terminal? No, my terminal, I say. So let's go somewhere. Yeah, should be there. Is it? Is it? So, um, is it okay? Mm -hmm. So, let's go. Let's compile this. Okay. Ah, uh, where is it? Should be there. So, let's compile this. So basically, you just have to put your uh, boost path, input path, and there it doesn't work. No, it does. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think it should be. Let me see if I can. Yeah, okay, great. So it compiles for quite a bit. Okay, so it compiles. So we should have, yeah, our executable there. So what happens? Let's see what the display X gives us. Okay, we have this stuff. So we basically see the recursive tree structure there with the indentations. And what do we have? We apply a modulus assign operators on a terminal of variable tag, okay, as a left hand uh, value. And the right hand value is a multiply node applied on the terminal containing the value tree with the complement of the right shift of a variable tag by the value 6. And if we look up what we had in our code, where is my mouse? Yeah, it's modulus assign of a variable tag with a variable tag plus three times the complement of x shifted by six. Okay, so basically it's just build a huge types acting as a tree. It doesn't do anything yet, okay, except, well, growing more tree as we put more operator on this. And this is basically the start of everything. We have a simple way as long as we manipulate terminal types from Goto to, to build whatever kind of trees we want using operators. So, okay, great, but 
most of the time when you are designing some libraries using uh, external templates, you don't want to have everything. You want to re restrict your operators that make sense on your entities to a subset of functions and operators. So we will go through this and see how we can work. So, yeah. so I just put it again. So you have everything there. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, proto display X basically displays some string for all of this and use a type info name for displaying a uh, special uh, structure type. So you can play around with that and we can see whatever going on. And just for kicks, here is something even more uh, stranger. So we can do this. Uh, let's try, okay, where is it? We can have something like this. Um, yeah. yeah, this is a comma. Okay, so it should be something like. Oh, yeah, we have good. <coughs> so, yeah, you have basically whatever. Something like this. Yeah, and I miss. Apparent. Apparent. Okay, let's see this. So, color operators, address of operator, the reference, mental operator, everything is there. Okay. Let's see what's going on. Okay, $10, it doesn't comply. <laughs> No. Yeah, so it's a bit. Yeah, the start is the same except it's caught in the comma operator node. Okay. And we have the assign of address of our terminal to the dereference of our terminal. So we basically can catch whatever. And we will see, well, we can discuss the utility of catching the comma operator, but it's something which is actually useful in some cases. Uh, we can basically have some kind of notion of lazy statement, okay? But basically, comma act as a novel loaded semicolon operators. Okay, so we can pull out statement one after the others and wait on the end of the statement to evaluate, uh, I mean, to the list of the statement to evaluate everything. So we can basically catch whatever. So, okay, so now, what do we have to uh, remember? We build proto enabled um, object using terminal and we tag the terminal with a specific tag that depends on whatever you need to capture. For now, we don't know anything. We'll see afterwards what we can actually embed uh, operation into this or that. But basically, this is entry point of everything. You have to look at your uh, DSL design and think about, okay, where are my terminals? And what are the semantics? And what kind of stuff I want to do on them? And from there, you will grow your uh, tree framework using this. So, now, what's going on? Okay, so, uh, the current state of the example doesn't do rather, anything rather interesting. You can just build stupid types, okay, that just stays there and do nothing. So the idea is to say, okay, uh, can we actually do something with uh, this kind of uh, types, okay, and make them do something interesting. So the first thing that we will do to add a semantic to these elements is basically restrict the set of operation that you are allowed okay, to apply on these terminal types. Okay. So we basically magically uh, use FINA to wipe out all the others and, find, and give us a way to actually check if yes or no a given expression is valid in our uh, DSL. So this is done by uh, what we call a grammar in Proton. So we still have our terminal stuff there. And we will build a grammar. And so what's a grammar in Proto? It's basically a structure that will be built using uh, pre-made elements provided by Proto. And the structure will act as a polymorphic function object, okay, on which we can apply result of to get the result of the application of the grammar to something. And if you instantiate the grammar, actually get the result of the something complete. And basically, the ideas behind uh, this part is to say, if you were designing a language from scratch and you wanted to make basically a normal compiler, and you want to write a grammar for your language, what do you use? BNF. Or, or EBNF, something like that. You have some things that basically say, okay, there is a structure of my grammar. 
Okay, and there is a lot of work on that. So the idea was to say, okay, what about having some kind of meta function that smell like EBNF, but let us define a static types which encodes, say, BNF into problem. So basically, what do we want to do in our grammar? Well, in our analytical function grammar, we want to capture our variable, some arithmetic values, let's say, double float integers, and any application of the classical operators like plus, minus, etc., on, well, whatever uh, expression verifying this grammar. Okay. So how does it look? Well, it looks like an alternative. We want this, or this, or any of that. Well, well, there is a spoiler at the end of the screen. Basically, we have what we call proto R, which is there, which is a meta function that say, okay, there is an alternative point into the definition of my proto grammar. So what do we want? Either we have terminal of variable type. Looks familiar. It's basically what we used a bit before to define our terminal object. And terminal here also act as, well, a grammar rules. Or I want some arithmetic values. So let's say you can nest or. So I want either int or float or double. And what they are, they will be terminals. So we just say, I want the terminal of in, or I want the terminal of float, or terminal of double. This is rather crude as a way to do this. We'll, be, we'll see later how to do this a bit better, but for now, this is the simplest stuff. And so what do we want? Well, we want to be able to do a plus between two any uh, elements, expression, that match the analytical function grammar. So what do I say? Yeah, I want to be able to do plus. Oh, whoa, okay. When I say down, I say down. Okay. So I want to do plus between two and the analytical function. Or minus, either unary or binary, multiplies and divides. And well, the name of the meta function are clearly what we expect to be. And what's missing there Com compared to a, B a classical BNF? So it's something I didn't care about. <coughs> Which is sorry rules uh, precedent precedent and why because there is no magic if you are doing expression templates and you use operators overloading of operators in C++ say well your precedence and priority will be whatever the precedence and the priority of the operator in the language will be so I can do whatever I want. This plus will act as a normal plus. And we have all the rules about precedences that the normal plus has, which basically doesn't need us to take care of that. <coughs> okay? um, other interesting point is the recursivity of the definition of the uh, analytical function structures. You can basically say, I have a struct which is analytical function, and you can reuse it directly there, okay? which basically gives these feelings of uh, natural way of defining what we want to do. We could have been uh, more strict, like for example, let's say for whatever reason I only want to multiply on the left by an integers, we will just say, okay, multiply analytical, analytical function terminal of int. And we can be as precise or as loose as we want. In the <coughs> same way there, I just use int, float, and double. But this will match whatever, int, const int, reference to int, const reference to int. And if you dig into the um, documentation, there is the smallest uh, stuff you can add there that say, I really want just reference to int, or I just want non-reference flow, and stuff like that. But the basic case is where you just say, I want that, whatever fits natural in the language, and say, yeah, I don't make any difference between an int and a const reference to int, well, it would catch whatever. Okay. So everything is made, so um, the natural way of thinking about the rules actually works like you expect it to work. Okay. So the basic is this. Oh, whoa. And what do we do afterwards? Basically, yeah, that's what I say there. It basically look like a BNF. Yeah, which is a bit crappy because uh, if I think if I was writing a BNF, I would have to take care about precedences, but it's basically something like this. So basically, this is one of the interests we have uh, first with Proto-World is that if you know how to write compilers, somehow, or at least this, 
at some point, uh, you will feel more at home that if you had to build all expression templates by hand. And basically, as long as you are able to think in terms of rules about uh, matching spots of the IST and doing stuff, you will be all fine. So basically, it's this. That will be basically the almost natural way to write the a BNF grammar without the precedence problem, of course, basically translates into this, which I think is rather uh, straightforward, more, more or less the syntactic uh, clutter around. We have a survival or some kind of arithmetic terminals, or we can apply a subset of operators on our grammar stuff. And this is basically all we need to do. Now what happens? Well, we can actually check. So we have our terminals again. Well, the stuff is that we can actually check if an expression actually match uh, whatever is going on. So we make a small template function that take whatever expression, display it just for uh, the beauty of it. And we use this meta function, which is called matches, that take two parameters, which is the expression to match and the grammar to match it against. And as you may think, it returns a static Boolean integral which is equal to true if your expression actually matches the grammar you define, and false if not. And there is a macro which is called proto asset matches and matches not, which basically act as a static asset that say, okay, I match the, your expression onto some grammar, and I trigger a static asset if it doesn't match. So you can actually have uh, early uh, error catching your function dealing with expression and say, okay, someone give me an expression and I don't know what it is. Is it something I need how to handle? And if not, I basically stop the compilation. And this is this kind of stuff and matches used in some of the context that basically helps uh, having protocols that doesn't end up in, well, a mess of error messages when you do something wrong and might actually be uh, strict on when to do this and when to actually assert on whatever, can actually uh, contrive your product-based DSL to behave uh, somehow nicely uh, with the users in terms of size of the error messages. So we basically get the value of the matches function, meta function there, and we basically say, okay, it's match or it doesn't match. And we do some tests. So some things that should work minus x divided by 2 plus 3 times x. And something that should not, x plus the complement of x times x shifted by log. Well, it doesn't make any sense anyway. <laughs> so, let's go. Do, do, do everybody get the USB key over there? Yeah. It's yeah? Right here. Oh. oh, there is two. What? Ah, <laughs> oh, so Indiana is walking, of course. <laughs> So let's compute the other one. And so I speak, I know I speak fast, so if something isn't clear, uh, just stop me if something doesn't make any sense. Does anyone have the cat to this USB? Uh, I think I have. This is up here. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I compile, oh, so finally. Yeah, I, I think I made a great thing testing this before coming in. Time. So it's a bit huge, so let's go there. So plus of minus of variable divided by 2 times 3 times variables match our grammars. And the shift left of whatever the crap is the other stuff, yeah, the shift left of terminal plus complement of terminal times terminals shifted by law doesn't match. Okay. Which was what we wanted to do. So we make half our steps. Now we can actually restrict whatever we want to do on this terminal, so it basically just act with whatever operators we want them to do. So we basically control uh, not yet the full semantic of our uh, terminal, but a great part. Which is basically, okay, I have to do, I can do this, and I can do that on these kind of types. And basically, the old stuff that we go there, I go back to the grammar description. Well, Let's say we have another kind of terminal that we want to get there, and it has its own uh, set of rules. We can have another uh, grammar for this one, and we can say, okay, in this one, I want either this or some kind of special operator if I take something from the other grammar. And we have a way to cross link grammar one with its others, 
and this will help us to buy to build uh, gear server where you can have strictly enforced semantic for each kind of entities and control the point where they can actually interact, which up, which actually make us able to get some very rich gear cells because you can have very strict stuff and well manage to manipulate them in the correct way. So this is the first most important blocks in Proto, definition of grammar. The grammar defines what kind of operation you can do on your expression templates. And you can actually test a given expression built from I don't know where actually matches. So that's the first block. And now we will go over uh, the two others. So now it will be the time where you will have to type a bit. I will explain what we will do and give you the pointers to the stuff and we will try to see what's going on. Where is it? Like step one makes sense. So uh, let's step with the first step of step one. So we made the first the simple stuff which is basically putting the grammar in its own file. So uh, the main file is less cluttered, but it's basically the same thing we did just before with the check for match function. I just put it in this in his own um, header files. And where you have to work is the step one dash zero zero source file. So we have our small variable based terminal. We can check it follows some grammar. Now how can we actually compute stuff with this? How can I actually build some expression using plus minus and stuff? Okay? And actually fill in some numbers and get some results. That is basically the application of whatever I draw with my operators and get some uh, value out of that. And there we go. Just checking. Yeah. Here we go about the second biggest important part of problem. So right now, what we are building with our operators and grammars is just basically a tree of whatever. Okay? We can constrain it to be matching or not matching a given set of grammar, but we basically can do anything. If we were looking at the wrong type of this tree, it would be something like proto x of something ugly, okay, and recursively ugly. Now, what we want to do is that what I want to build is not just a tree, okay? It's an expression, and what's the relation between the tree and the expression is that an expression is built on top of a tree has the same structure, but it's extendable by the uh, library developers, and you can have actually uh, functions and methods on them. And you will basically imbue your IST with some real interfaces that do whatever you want. And so basically what we will do is that we, so the term we use in Proto is that we will extend our tree to match a given interface of an expression. And after that, we will be able to take whatever expression and we will be able to call whatever interface we give to the expression through the extension mechanism. So it's basically going from a row tree to something that has the same structure. Okay? It will match the same grammar and we will see later that we can apply the same stuff on it, except it can do something now. So it's basically a wrapper around the naked abstract syntax tree, which is something we usually don't want to deal with because there is nothing inside except the structure. And so the first point would be this, giving the domain-specific interface to our IST. So we move the grammar code somewhere. And to do this, how does it work? Well, when we call operators on our types, we basically go through a construction mechanism that says, say, okay, you're calling plus on these two exp proto expressions, so I will just build a new proto expression which contains a plus node and glue the two subtree to the thingy and give you back. Thanks for playing. But what we want to do is to say, whenever I build a tree using this kind of expression, I want you to give me another tree which is wrapped in the same type of expression. So I conserve the semantic of what I put inside. <coughs> and this is done by what we call a domain. And the domain class will say, OK, when I see expression of this type coming in, OK, into some operators, 
I will, I will know that I have to use what we call a generator to build the result of the operator instead of just sending out another naked tree. So basically, when you will see an, analytic, an analytical function expression coming in, for example, a, a unary minus node, it will say, oh, okay, this is, an, an anal this is a function expression. And I know, we'll see how we do this, I know that if I put it into a unary minus node, I will have to make an unary minus node of this and wrap it into another function expression and return this. And this is the basic stuff we can do with, with domain and generator. But the generator is nothing more than a regular polymorphic function object. And any developers can actually build his own to do special stuff. For example, real life, real life example, uh, you build a matrix based DSL. And what you want to do is to say, okay, I have two matrices coming in, and I want to make a plus between this. What I will do is that at runtime, when I would call the generator function to build a new expression, I will check that the matrix size match. If it doesn't, I will assert, preventing the construction of the matrix expression with wrongly sized uh, left and end side. Or you can have generators with static test or whatever complex you want. Uh, if you look at the uh, talk from Eric last year, it's basically one of the tricks used to build uh, the conditional part of the uh, small Phoenix-like library, uh, which is in the example. So there is a lot of strict going on with domain and, and, and generator. And it's basically the only trios that we will return, retrieve every, every time. We have a grammar to say what that we want to do in our languages. We have the expression class that say, when I build something matching this grammar, here is how I want it to behave. Okay? And we have the domain and the generator somehow that say, okay, and here is how I build those expressions each time I have to build a new one. Okay? And basically, a generator generates an expression following a grammar, okay, and all these cycles like that. So grammar we saw, and we will see how the expression is built, and what's the domain here, and what's the generator. So the first stuff we have to do is basically defining the domain. So I think I do this already. Oh, no, great. So, we have a shortcut there. Uh, is it of working right now or not? If not, it will be a bit. It is. It is. So you can go there. It will give you to the uh, documentation about product. I, I mean, then I will try to get it on there so I can actually display the documentation at the same time. And we will see what details is going on. Okay. Of course, for me, it doesn't work. <laughs> Great. And now we will, now we will do. Okay. Don't ask. So I will display the documentation. You can comment on it. So it should be something like URL.com slash Yeah. Wow, well, which is far simpler than the real one. Yeah. So is it okay or should I zoom a bit? Or do people in the back have this on their own screen? Is it okay? No, it is not. Yeah, I guess. So how is it supposed to work? Yeah, no, it's just not. Chrome, Chrome, zoom in. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, of course not. We just load it and go to the correct point. Okay, so it's rather trivial. So here is a part that we have to work a bit. So we go it piece by piece. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to build a new domain, let's call it analytical domain. As we say, yeah, every time I have an analytical, an analytical expression, I want you to build it something inside. And for this, Proto def defines some very basic domain and generator classes. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Whatever. Or it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. So, basically, whatever domain classes you define actually usually inherits from proto domains. Okay? And proto domain await a given number of uh, parameters. The first one, which is. Uh, I will say something stupid. No, it is not. Which is mandatory, is the generator classes you will use. 
So we have a classic proto generator that doesn't do anything except, okay, I have expression coming in and I put it into this wrapper. And what does it take as a parameters? It takes a template class type, which is your, the type of your expression. Okay. And whenever something goes inside this generator, it takes an IST type and pass it as a first template parameter of this class, generating your expression using your IST. Okay. There is a bit more complex uh, generator. Uh, one which is rather interesting is that sometimes you build an expression around some pod types. And you wish that the expression types is still a pod because it helps you doing stuff. And so Proto has a pod generator that works the same, which actually uh, keep uh, the pod nest, let's say, of your, exp of your uh, expression through your, the wrapping. Joe, yep. can you increase the font size just a little Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. of course. I said a bit. Okay. <coughs> Is it Thank there? You. Probably the other way. Go down. No, no. Yeah. Go up. No, go down. Okay, you got me. <laughs> okay. Sure yeah. Was. Up, up, up. Yeah, I, I, it's not me that wrote that, so I don't know where the stuff are. <laughs> and so, well, basically what happens, this stuff has an operator parenthesis, okay, that gets the IST in, and call the generator, which itself has an operator parent, and go through this and generate the expression. So it's basically a couple of uh, polymorphic function object one into the others. And you can write whatever you want there as long as it fulfills this. You could write your own domain, it's a bit more complex because the domain concept weights on uh, a bit obscure type left to be exposed. But usually what you want to do is maybe getting some custom generator. So always it works. So what do we need to do? Well, we will stay with the simple stuff, okay, using this classical proton generator. But domain has a couple of other parameters. The second parameter is in, is, is in fact the grammar you want to check an expression uh, over before generating the new expression. So if you say proton domain, proton generator, something, Something grammar, it's basically the same. Yeah, okay. Each time I see an IST coming in, I know that I would have to generate this kind of type using this generator. But only if the expression I see coming in actually matches the grammar. And if it does not, I will spin I out call and you will get a no search function for blah blah blah. And so that is basically what we need to do. It's basically, we have to tie through the domain or we generate expression of something using grammar of the same something. So, how does it look? Oh, where is it? So, basically, we will start to write something like... <coughs> uh, let's be a bit lazy. So we have basically an analytical domain, okay? That we will inherit from proto domain, okay? And what we do, what we do, we use the proto generator basic stuff. Okay. Uh, where is it? Uh, generator. Yeah, same. And what do we what, what will we use? We will use this type. So we just need at this point we just need a forward declaration. So this is a type. This will be the type of our expressions, okay? Which is coming into your template from uh, template classes with one parameters. So it can fit there. So well, let's do it. <coughs> Then space is huge. And done. And what does this do? It's basically bind. Yeah, except I did out of the stuff. Come on. So this, if we do this, we just say every time I see something coming in, I'm generating an analytical expression instead of just a raw IST. And what we want to do is this, yeah, you do this, but only if the stuff match our grammar. We just have the second parameters to the main. Something like this. 
uh, what's his name is a grammar already. Well, an article grammar I bet. Let me pass a grammar stuff. Okay? What is called an analytical function? Oh, of course. Yeah, I have one chance over one to fail, and I did, so yeah, great. Okay, got it. Okay. When you see an, an IST coming in that matches grammar, wrap it into this. And we're done. This basically ties everything together. Okay. The grammar, the way we want to wrap it into something that does something useful at some point. Okay. And basically, every time we try to generate this, we will check over that. And this basically replace, I know how many people try to write expression templates all by themselves already? Yeah, how many, how many of you cry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, 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 don't, don't be ashamed, I cry too. This basically replace all of whatever enabling crap you should have put on all your function operators overload. One, two, three, four, five months. Joel. Yeah. Um, I talked about this stuff to Eric, and he tried to explain this yeah. to me. And my m major problem was, what part of this is compile time? Which, which part of this is runtime? It's fully run. It's fully compile time. Basically, well, by going to the details, let's take operator plus as an example. The return type of operator plus is basically if the left or the right hand side of my plus is a proto expression. Mm -hmm. And when I do result of, of the domain of whatever the domain is returns, then I can build the stuff and the result of give me the time. But, but when you are defining operator plus, yeah. you are defining the return type to yes. be the special type, yeah, yeah, which, yes. which, which is your, your tree, yeah. right? But you are also inside of it creating an object, yes. right? But that you are returning. Yes, of this except, type. except if the sphenoid mm -hmm. check fails, mm -hmm. the operator places will be removed from the overload set, and the code inside will never be uh, called because the compiler will never actually try to use it. So when you are saying, if you give me an AST that, that's tree, that's the operator. So yeah, the that's AST the, tree is the type. Yes, it's the type okay, of your type. input okay. uh, elements on both sides. And basically, is the expression yes. also a type? Yes, everything is type. And basically, what happens is that the proto operator plus is basically the most uh, underspecified template function you <coughs> can have. It's basically template class L class R operator plus of L R with mm -hmm. a huge SFINI block that uses this to know what happens. And basically, everything would match that at first. And if this say, no way, you don't match the grammar, I can't do anything, well, so the compiler will throw it out and try another operator process, if any is defined. And if none is defined, you will say, oh crap, there is no operator process for this. Now, if it match, yeah, it will select the operators, and we know that now we are allowed to compile the code to generate uh, <coughs> the new IST from the inside. And then the, co the compiler will generate the code, <coughs> which is inside the operator class, and do whatever is needed after it. <coughs> but if any test there fails at compile times, <coughs> no parts, because nothing will be generated at all. Okay? So this is very important. This has basically two impacts. First, well, this has a cost at compile time. There is nothing magic, okay? Which is rather small uh, in the, your big pictures. And you know that if you are going to build an expression, it means that you have the right to do it because the grammar is satisfied. So you never, uh, I mean, when something enters a, a generator, it has been pre-approved by the grammar, so you can actually do stuff with it. And this is something which is actually useful, uh, for example, in the context of the uh, a custom generator, because you know that where you are in a generator, you want to do something special, you know that the stuff that's going in has been checked, and you can do whatever you want and you are not computing stuff that doesn't make any sense. Because the domain already checked that the grammar was okay. And this is basically what we will use everywhere. And every, everywhere we use something that build a new expression using Prodo, somewhere inside there is a check that calls this at some point. Okay? So, that is basically what helps us tie one thing with another. So now, we have our domain, we have our grammar. 
We miss the third guy's age group, which is the expression itself. Yeah, so this is done, in fact. Done. Now, we will build our analytical expression. And there, for now, I will let you read the, end, the documentation a bit about the accession systems. And I will let you write uh, the basic code so you can see what's going on. And what I want you to do is, I want you to give this expression a special uh, function call operator that takes one value. Okay. Doesn't do anything right now, but just the operator is there and you catch a value, maybe re just return it. So we can actually test that when we will build an expression later, if we put some kind of parent for, it compiles. Okay? We won't do anything fancy right now with the value. Just to change that, we can actually add whatever stuff there. We can go over broad, like adding methods or whatever to test. Like, I don't know, make, make a, a, a print method that just called display x for itself and see if you can do x plus x dot print and see what's going on. Okay? Basically, look in the documentation which is there. How can I turn this into an expression classes that extends whatever is there and have your special function? Okay? So it should be long, shouldn't be long. We'll just go radius. So you have this there. I will let you turn around and if you have a question, I will just wander around yourself. What uh, what? Extends. No. Oh no, I did. So it's kind of S at the end. Let's go. Okay, so we are already have this. In our case, it's called analytical domain. And here is all. Let's do a s slash calculator slash analytical expression there, and you will see how it's going on. Okay? So I will let you actually type so you can get the stuff. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Okay? And well, I will let you a bit of time there so you can. So the domain is the, ah. some kind of hub yeah. that say there is a grammar and there is an expression types and if I have an IST coming in which matches the grammar, I wrap it into these expression types. Okay? I don't know if I, Ray, if I draw there, is it okay or not? Uh, probably or do I have not. to draw on the whiteboard? <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess it's not there. Well, basically, uh, you do something like this. Uh, I don't know if you can. I, maybe I should. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, better. So let's say you have a, a terminal x and you write x plus uh, 3. Okay. But what type is x? So x is a proto terminal of whatever. Okay. So this is a proto uh, terminal. Okay. So we have a proto type in an expression. So proto kicks in, captures a plus. And at first time, what does this build? It builds something that looks like proto x uh, two type plus. I'm doing this by, by memory, so it should not be taken as regular stuff. And then something like arcs. Uh, so we have a terminal of whatever. And the terminal of n. That's what that's the road type, or maybe this. That's the road type which is built by the operator classes. And once it builds that, it kicks in into the domain. And so the domain sees these types coming in. I say, okay, do you match well, my where grammar? Where does this domain come in? Okay, the domain. What? Well, the domain comes in because when you have an expression stuff there. The extension of the, domain, of the expression says, when you see when I have these types, I build these types using this domain. Basically, this stuff is an expression types, and when you build the expression types, you tie it to the domain. Okay. So this is as this, the type of this thing is something like what is a brush? Of course. <laughs> ah, yeah, we're missing the episode. No. What's the type of X? Somehow, we receive a letter. The type of X is something like, so let's, let's say it's an analytical expression stuff. The type of X has to be analy 
typical expression of proto x blah 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 zero because it's a terminal doesn't have any uh, sub nodes of a type terminal and what's the stuff inside the terminal it's all uh, what's the name of the stuff variable type yeah is what we use okay. so for now believe me this is a type of the type of x we will see a bit later how we got there okay check check so this is this is a type of the type of x it goes into the plus. So we have this on one side and we have the integers on the other side. We take both types, we fit it to the uh, competent part of domain and say, okay, I have this, I have this, I, sorry, I have this, I have a terminal of it. But who defines the operator plus for this type? It's all automatically defined by proto. Proto says if one of this is a proto type, then go through there. And basically when your expression types narrate from this. So there is a subtle type of going on that say, oh, I'm a proto expression. So analytical expression, expression is, is like a proto, proto expression. expression. Okay. There, is, there is a meta function which is called uh, is x that basically say yes or no, it's an expression of, from proto. Mm -hmm. And basically, x tends to define the type there which is called is proto x. And we have a small stuff to check if it's inside. So, x is of these types. So Three. the signature of this operator plus. Oh, it's fucking you. Right. I know. But it, it it's is it's proto. But, but it is defined as taking uh, the first argument is analytical expression no, or proto it's, expression. It's whatever, whatever. It's template class L, L, uh -huh. operator plus L, L. Okay. And we have the NW uh, stuff that actually checks that one of the other is an expression from proto. Okay. And does the domain says okay you can go? Mm -hmm. it is. It's a complete, uh, and, uh, I mean, most generic possible template. It's a template of whatever, whatever. So mm -hmm. it catch everything. But to go through proto, one of this or one of whatever number of arguments you have in your uh, operators or function has to be a proto expression. And basically, proto expression contaminates your expression that say, okay, stop. I'm there, I'm a proto expression, so everything is lazy, and you go through the proto operator or function. So the operator plus inside, although it got a proto expression as yeah. an argument, yeah. it actually can pull out the yes. domain from it. Yes, okay. and go through inside. Mm. And basically, there is a meta function that say, given two types I don't know nothing about, try to find the first one, which is an expression, and get the domain from it. And we don't go there in this tutorial, but there is a way that, oh yeah, except I have two expressions in the two parts of the stuff. And, ah, this one is from domain A, and this one is from domain B, and we have a set of rules to know what we should take. Mm -hmm. But, well, we can discuss that afterwards if you want. Okay. So basically, uh, to complete, so we have X, which is of this type, tree, which is of step int, and basically, this contains your expression, and both of these are passed through the domain. And the domain says, okay, I'm trying to make a plus between this and the type which is not a proto expression. So the first stuff it does is that, okay, if I don't know anything about this type, well, I plug it into a terminal because I don't know what to do else. And so I have to check if this stuff match my grammar. Does it? Yes, it does. Okay, so if it does match my grammar, I take this and I send it to the generator I've been defined with, and I let it take this and wrap it into a new analytical expression. So what does all operators does when you have expression which extends the domain, you say, okay, I pull out the IST from the expression, I build the new one, I check if it matches grammar, and if it does, I put it into another expression and I return this. So for the users, analytical expression goes in, analytical expression goes out. And in between, stuff happens that match and build, destroy whatever. And this is what we got. At the end, we generate, this is generated, and basically, inside this, we got reference to the actual runtime uh, values that we need, and this is plugged into the, expression, the analytical expression that we define. And we return this. 
Okay, and Proto take care of all the details about do I return my value or my reference, what do I copy and what do I do. We don't have to, for now, uh, worry about that. So what's going on there? I say, yeah, I have a calculator expression. In our case, an analytical expression. And what do I do? I extend it to say that for a given row AST expression, I want to build, a, in our case, analytical expression of something. Okay, using the rules defined by our domain. Okay. And this is basically says, okay, this class basically works the same way as the raw IST in terms of operator overloading, except it's not a raw IST, it's something wrapped with whatever methods of function you want. <laughs> Come on. Even the screen dies. Yes. Yes. Is it back? It is back. It is not. No, it is. So basically, we say, yeah, you have to behave like this, following the rules that are there. Okay. So this <coughs> has the exact behavior of the IST we defined before. Except, as we control the definition of this type, well, we can put whatever methods we want. In addition to the IST behaviors, we can say, yeah, compute something, print yourself, uh, serialize, uh, whatever you want. Okay. Or do whatever domain-specific interface this entity should have. And by defining these expression classes, we are able to actually embed the IST with whatever semantic we want. Okay. So this is a point where we say, okay, I have this IST and now I want it to be like that. And this is where we put our, let's say, the machinery of our domain-specific languages. And or this, whatever is, you this need. is the point where you are jumping into runtime, actually, right? Because oper operator yeah. function yeah. call is a and runtime. You will, and basically, you will get there. You will get inside that. So there is a bit of clutter is over there, which should disappear with OX, but currently, what is happening? So, basically, what how is your own expression types constructed? It needs to be constructed from a raw IST, which is of this type. So whenever you construct your expression with your IST, well, with a potential default values, well, what you do, you just pass the IST to the parent types. And the parent types is this, which contains all the machinery and boilerplate code to store the stuff as it should be. So whenever you construct an expression, you see a raw ST coming in, and you pass it to your parent classes and we do all the proto backend works. But now you are calling IST the runtime expression? No, no, no. Or the... I mean, we are still... Oh, well, okay. Because in the constructor, yeah. you are actually getting a runtime yeah. object. Yeah, when I went out, so you get an instance of the IST mm -hmm. that you pass to the stuff that calls store it as it does. And BEX is the IST type. Okay, so when I get an instance of an IST, I just pass it to whatever my parent class is and it will take care of doing what it needs to do. I don't have to care about that. This is a small macro uh, to be sure that if you define a grammar with a custom operator equal, because you want to catch equal in your IST, it gets forwarded into your expression and it's not hidden by the default operator of assignment operators. Just the stuff that basically say, okay, uh, using uh, parent base type uh, colon colon operator equal basically just say that and after what yeah for example in the calculator example yeah we have what we need with the operator parentheses and do whatever and for now this is uh, non relevant to what we are doing okay so basically what we you need to do is basically do this you extend your expression types using extends and the proper types there in the proper domain. You construct it using your bash type, which is this, and you get back your operatory core. Okay, so everything works as it should. Okay, is it more clear? It's more clear, yeah, not quite 100%, but yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's more clear. Yeah, it's, well, it took a while to get into all the uh, intricate details, so I'm trying to get this one. Our grammar, our expression types, and we say that we need to build this expression types when it follows this grammar. And this is done by saying, okay, our expression types 
depends on the domain that actually is bound to uh, the grammar stuff and the generator stuff. And so this is basically the, your border plate you have to put to get your classes act as a proto expression. Basically all of this. And afterwards, you can do whatever you want. Okay. And so you can, you can actually embed your expression with whatever. And whatever methods you put there, you will be able to call them on whatever combination of your terminals using your grammar. Any other questions on this? Yes? Alright, so can you go down, scroll, scroll down another seven lines? Where? Alright, so... For is that? Huh? Alright, so right. I, as far as I can tell, you don't need a context because you only have one. Well, right? in fact, we won't use context at all. Yeah, because you only have one argument and that you're going to call directly, so you don't need... Or what am I missing there? This is... This is related to the actual calculator example. Yeah, we will do something completely different. All right, so what you can do is operate a parenthesis, double D, return D. We don't want to do any computation yet. Oh, okay. It's, a, it's the next step. We just want to have the definition of the parent, the parent operators okay. and check if we can actually call it on our expression. We won't do any computation yet. We just want to yeah. check that we created our expression types right and you can call whatever new methods we added to the expression semantic. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just after. Is it okay? I just put the relevant part there. So this is basically uh, the thing you have to wrap your head around. Okay, I have my rules for building my stuff, but now I want to. I want my stuff to do something because if not, it doesn't help. So. <coughs> You create your types that you want to do whatever you need on your HST and you just embed it, you, you imbue it with the extend stuff. Say, okay, now you are a proto expression that works this way. And afterwards, I will tell you what special stuff you need to do uh, with respect to your own semantic. So, in the calculator expression, we have these uh, function call operators that feed the uh, uh, value to the calculator itself. Uh, it could be something like the class, again, the classical matrix stuff, uh, DSL where basically your operator call uh, will actually check what kind of left and hand side he has and if he can actually eval his, evaluate his right hand side into the left hand side he will do it because that's what we, we want it to do and stuff like that. So it's here where all the domain specific semantics are actually defined and implemented. Okay. Or at least a large part of them. So extends do this. And for the guys, uh, remember the pod generator uh, a bit further, of course it doesn't work with this because in all three you can't have a pod that inherits from something. Okay? So you can't have a classes like this using pod generator because it will bitch that it's not a pod. And when you have want to generate an expression type which is a pod, you can check the documentation a bit further down, there is a set of macro that you put there and that basically do all of this without any inheritance, so your type still is a pod class. That's a bit of a detail, but if you are interested, you could look at it. Uh, there is a lot of interest to get pod uh, expression types because, uh, well, it actually helps compilers still being able to do to pull out optimization it used to, even through your high-level uh, expression types. And in some cases, uh, it's actually the difference between, uh, well, a DSL which has good performance and just a DSL. But it's more or less, you know, well, it depends on a lot of stuff. So usually you start with this because it's a trivial thing to do. And if you're not satisfied with whatever coming out, you can go on uh, you, to other stuff. Can you just go in a bit more detail about how this pod expression... Oh, I can show you. Well, so, in the previous episodes, <laughs> I don't know where. Well, what about that? Let's, let's go back to the uh, generator stuff. Okay, so I can have the... Uh, oh, come on. Of course. Wireless <laughs> windows. Ah, great. Okay, uh, well. Yes, it's like you using windows. Yeah, so. This is how we could have defined our domain using pod generator. Like you use the same stuff, except you use pod generator. And by doing this, 
What's the difference between photo generator and photo pod generator? I, well, I can, but you could look at the source code. And basically, generator says, oh, I see an X coming in, and I have to generate a this. So I make a this of X using a constructor, and I rotate it. And when you are in pod generator, you say, oh, there is an X coming in, and I need to do this. And so you, pod generator say, oh, I have a this X equal curly braces what's coming in using the aggregate constructors for pod types and returns whatever. It's the only difference. When you have generators, it calls a constructor, and when you are in the pod generator, it just initializes a pod and returns it. Mm -hmm. But now, if you want this to work, if you want this to work, you can't. Oh, is it? It's down. I hope. Is it? Oh yeah, it's hard now. Blah blah blah. Okay, where is my characteristic stuff? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, we'll go extend. Yeah, should be. So now let's imagine calculator domain is a pod is pod based. Okay, it uses pod generator. You can't have that because this type can't be a pod because it generates from something, and pod types can't generate from anything. So you can't use this. So okay, what's it here? Well. We have a set of macro, which is originally called. Come on. Where is it? No. Proto extends. But just. Where is it? Come on. Yeah. And basically, here is how you could have written it. You don't inherit from anything. So the proto extends, whatever, disappear. So this, is, this can be a pod now. But to be able to, for proto to be able to recognize this as a prototype, you need to have a lot of stuff going on inside. And instead of being inherited from proto extends, they are generated by this macro. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And this basically do the same thing except using local time depth. That's basically all. And in this case, your stuff is a pod, and you can go through pod generation stuff, etc., etc., etc. Okay. And in some cases, it's actually interesting. Okay. Uh, okay so now, now I'm confused. Ah. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Because, tell me. because when I was asking about operator plus, right? Yeah. Um, the calculator or, yeah, or whatever, yeah, whatever was there was was inheriting from a, a yes. proto expression. Yes. So you. So the compiler could find the, yes. the, the overloading for proto expression, yes. but now cal the calculator does ah. not inherit from anything. Except this stuff generates a macro, in the macro there, there's yeah. a type def, which is called uh, is proto x. And basically we use MPL as xx to check that. And in the case we inherit from proto extend, uh, the type def is in proto extend, so it get sucked in the uh, child classes and it can be found using MPL as XX. We basically use a type def okay. to check if it's something else. So okay. it's basically independent if the uh, expression place is or not a pod. We always do this and we know if the, if the type def is inside. But there, at some point in this chain of yeah. commands there is the C++ compiler that just sees plus. Yeah, and it goes through this under specified overload. If you want, I can choose a source code for operator plus afterwards. Yeah. So you can see. Uh, that probably won't make Yeah, it won't make any sense. <laughs> but the first time I was looking at that, I was like, okay, I don't grab a, a, a crap about what's going on. Let's look at the source code. It should be clear. <laughs> and then I said, okay, oh, let's reread the documentation again. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's a bit deep. Yeah. If you actually. So there is. Uh, Eric has a version of Proto that does not have. A, uh, that does not have the meta uh, the yeah. uh, the preprocessor junk in it. Right? Yeah. So, it's, so it's, it's more it's more it's more clear to read it. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not sure it's up to date. <coughs> so it's not speaking? up to date. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a version two or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. At some point, in fact, uh, Eric tried to do all of this work using MPL and Fusion because, well, guys, it's meta programming, so let's use our meta programming framework stuff. Except it was slow as hell to compile. Mm -hmm. And basically, he went down through uh, rewriting a lot of it using uh, preprocessor programming. All right, so I got a couple of questions. Yeah. All right, so 
for for example, in this case, so you, you get double as your result type here, right? Yes. So is it possible to pick the result type based on what's on the expression? The expression gives you what the function call operator gives you. It's, it's complicated because when you are there and you need to extract something from there, uh -huh. okay, like for example, say, oh yeah, I have an expression coming in, and I will do result of of whatever of the expression, for uh -huh. example, and you want to use it there, it won't work because <laughs> in this context. So your type is not complete yet, and you can't use this. I went there, and it doesn't work. I can show you an example. All right. So for this calculator example, if you want to say, let's say, arg one plus three. Yeah. Okay? If everything is in, if every or four plus three. Yeah. Okay. So if everything is a terminal of int, I want to get int, and everything is a terminal of double, I want to get doubles, right? So yes. That's the basic thing. So how would I go about doing that? Oh well, what you do is that you have an external meta function that say, okay, I get something that I compute your type. Okay. okay. And you use a meta function there, but the meta because it, no, I mean it's completely related to proto. It's because you can't have something that explicitly asks for a concrete. Uh, no, sorry, you can't have something that there ask for a dependent something that is dependent on there until the log stuff is finished compiling at this parsing. Yeah, but this is not. I mean, this is not instantiated, right? Until it's, until you get an exact. Type. Except it is. I, I, I can go on on this after what you want. I, I okay. went through this and I, I can actually forward you to the mail I sent on the mailing list and I was like, come on, I have this ma my matrix expression and I want the result type of my operators to access an element of my matrix be whatever the type of the expression is when I evaluate it. And I can because you are trying to access something which depends on the type you are creating right now and it doesn't work. Okay, second question. So in your in your example, yeah. the example that we are following, that is, we are creating a, a, a variable of type uh, variable tag. Yeah. All right. So if you use that in two different uh, translation units, yeah. How do you avoid the uh, one def, uh, oh. ODR violations? Well, the question makes sense. Yes. Where is it? Grammar dot HTTP. Oh, it's the other one, one, of course. You speak of this. Where is it? Come on. Scroll it down. I think it's down, but I don't see it anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, let's see on the other side. Uh, this. Yeah. Well, it's const and it's a pod. Okay. So it just instantiated initially T we want and it doesn't fuck up. Huh? How does it not work? How does it not violate ODR? You can look at the uh, annex of photo documentation. There is a huge rationale okay. about that, but it just works. Okay. It doesn't work. If you remove that, it's a bit tricky. Okay. So I'm still grasping the details of that, and I don't want to tell you stupid stuff. Eric explains this in great detail in the internet, so you can check that. I think there are const globals and internal link. Yeah, there is something like this. I so don't remember the details. Is internal to that PU or it's internal to the translation. Yeah, okay. and so you don't care about what happened in those. And the fact is that we don't have any. Well, the other stuff is that yeah. we don't. We don't store anything in this, it's just a placeholder to be recognized in the expression. Okay, yeah. Yeah. If we were storing something inside, I would say yeah, maybe there is crap going on. But everything is working because of the const. And maybe because it's a pod too, I don't remember. Because no, I think it's just a const, yeah. Well, it's a bit tricky. So it's part of this, uh, let's say, uh, side effect of C++ that we shamelessly abuse in products, yeah. but it works. And uh, yeah, it's basically the same trick which is used in Lambda and Phoenix and whatever. Okay. So, okay, yes. Uh, to the first question, um, I think this should be documented that the, this, this return type yeah. business is not dependent because when, when yeah. I just wrote it, I, I would have expected that it was dependent. Yeah, the thing is that there is case it is, and there is case it is not, and it's, well, I, I will forward you to the discussion we had on this. It's on okay. the mailing list. Yeah. And, uh, but it's basically, uh, there is terms that work because you don't require to use the expression type in your computation. Yeah. But if you use the, ex the, exp if you use the IST type, it works because it's there. If you use the expression type, it doesn't. And it's a bit blurry, where there's one stop and the other word. So, well, I'm sorry again. So, I'll yeah. you again. So, what's the difference between the expression type and the AST type? In this the case? IST is just the raw structure. Oh, okay, all right, all right. And the expression is the structure plus whatever okay. semantic you want to okay. tackle okay. it. Okay. No, it's okay. So, 
do we have some that? Give us a solution. Okay. Well, we cheat a bit. So, where is it? It should be there. Is it? No. Nah, hold on, hold on. We still haven't gone to the last step, right? So. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> well, so, here is what we did, okay, already. And here is the expression, oh, sorry. Here is the expression uh, stuff. So, we extend IST using this, using the analytical domain. We define our base type, we define our constructor, and we get back the assignment. Okay? And what do we put into the operator parentheses? Well, I put a couple of them, but that's key, yeah. You can put whatever and just return whatever value for now. Okay? And now what do we miss? Oh, hold on. Why, oh, do yeah. make, why do you make it const here? Why are this const number const? Because it doesn't modify the expression itself. Okay, but it doesn't have to be const. Yeah, just to re I mean, just okay, to, right, yeah. Okay. It should not, it could not. I mean, you can have modifying stuff inside. I mean, it's your classes. You can have additional states there if you wanted to, which will be tacked on the state of the expression to itself and do whatever you want in these states. Okay. Usually, it looks like this because we don't have much uh, interest to get a special uh, state of it. And so we will miss one thing, which is how we turn. Can, how can we turn our small x into an analytical expression? Because currently it's just a terminal of whatever. And basically, well, we just make it so. We build an analytical expression of what we have before, terminal variable tag tag. It's still const. Okay, and that's what makes the world go. Except, yeah, it's just constructed like that. Okay. Because it's, not, it's no more a pod, okay? because it's now an analytical expression that inherits from something. So the funky uh, curly braces in initialization disappear. Okay? But it's our very same x, same stuff. And so what's going on? Well, we can still do this. And it still works the same. Why? Because it's this stuff we check that this expression match our grammar. When we match, what we do is that we see our expression coming in, we unwrap the IST and we check it through the grammar, and it works the same. So if you have a raw IST or an expression like that, it works the same. And I could have done something like, well, I would do it, in fact. You could do something like this, just to check that the parent operator works. You can do this. Well, you can do this without crapping out. I can write that. Okay, everybody is okay that this is some kind of expression types, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what type is this? It's some analytical expression stuff. So I can actually do this if I want. Why? Because, yeah, this is of type analytical expression, and I do whatever I needed to get this operator on, okay? And this should return one, because I think that's what we do. Yeah, we return the first operator. So, it's basically the very same thing, except we now wrap everything in something we can actually recognize and walk on and have a special semantic. And now, to answer your question, because I see it coming from far, <laughs> if you want, you can write a function that says, oh, I want a function that takes something, but I want it to take some analytical expression and nothing else. Okay. Well, that's trivial, because we have this types there, and you can just write template class t, my function, analytical expression of t, something. And you know what you will get there is some expression, as complex as you want, that is actually wrapped into this and then match your grammar and has been constructed using your generator through your domain. And you can actually say, okay, whenever I have an, I have an analytical expression of whatever, I know I can do something like that. Okay. And this is basically one of the tricks we use to say, okay, for example, let's say, yet again, you have your matrix DSM grid with proto, and you want to say, okay, I want to um, take the transpose of my matrices, and I don't want uh, to take anything else. Well, just write template class T, transpose, ma matrix expression of T, and you will have whatever expression of matrices you have, which means that you can write transpose of X, transpose of 3 times X plus B and whatever, all automatically. And you will just catch 
it basically will act as some kind of catch-all for your kind of expression you want to get. You can actually function that say explicitly, I want an expression of this. Directly as a template private. Okay, let's compile the stuff so it works. So, is the process okay for everybody? Okay, you have to uh, go through this. Um, where is it? One. Um, pom, 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 pom. Where is it? This is a very important step of tying an expression structure to something and adding. Um, yeah, come on. Pick is that. Step one. Okay. Should it work? And you should have one at some point. Yeah. So, uh, 3 times x plus 1 over x match the grammar. Wait. And when we pass it 1 to 3, we return the first value, which is 1. Okay. Yeah, we still does not do anything else. Very interesting, but we are getting there. So, we can match stuff. We can embed our expression with uh, whatever semantic we want. So now, let's do some work. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Already? Yeah. I spent three hours already? One and a half. One and a half. Yeah, great. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Stop that! Oh! <laughs> Was that shit? It's six yeah. already? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, take a break, and we are going for the rest just after that. Say you have an, an abstract syntax tree containing variables, constants, and let's say our four classical operators, and you have this tree. What would be the algorithm to actually say, if I pass my variable value, or do I compute the evaluation of the expression of the function? Which is encoded in the tree. How do you do that? Well, if you're at a leap, just return the value, otherwise the value, right? right? Yeah, and every time you cross a node, you call whatever function the node is with the evaluation of its uh, sub expression. And you do this from, well, uh, actually from the leaf and going up. Okay, or you can do from top, say, okay, I have a node there, let's evaluate both. And you do this recursively until you go to the leaf. If it's constant, you return the constant. And if it's a variable, you just return the value of the variable. Okay, how do we describe the grammar for validating our expression? We say, if I match this, I, I can match this, or I can match that, or I can match something else. If you were drawing in your head the algorithm that probably used to match a random expression to a grammar, what you would do? Oh, I will start from the first node, I will check if it's somewhere, and if it's somewhere, I will just ask it to check if both of its children <coughs> is actually matching the grammar. Mm -hmm. And basically, what do we do? We do basically the same thing in both cases. We have a tree, we walk it down somehow, and in the case of grammar, we don't, don't do anything except checking it's correct. You can come in. <laughs> it's not like it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. For the grammar, we don't do anything except checking its matches. And for the evaluation, we say, oh, I have, a I have a terminal of a variable, so I will return my variable values. And if I have a constant, well, I just return the constant. And if I have a plus, well, let's call plus on the evaluation of my children. So basically, it's the same basic stuff. And it's so the same basic stuff that in Proto, it's the same basic stuff. Okay? The same way we build the grammar, we will build what we call a transform. And a transform is a recursively defined polymorphic function object that look like a grammar. You will see that afterwards. But for each part of the grammar, we can say, oh, if you match that, please do this on uh, the stuff you just match. And to do this, I will go a bit faster on this part because I really want us to go to the end. Huh? What do we want to do? So, if it's a terminal, we just return the value. So it says it's a constant value or whatever we pass as a variable. And if it's an operator, well, we would do what the natural C++ operator does. So if I have a plus, I get a sum. If I have a minus, I use a minus, whatever. 
So A is what the transform looks like. <coughs> we want to evaluate something. And as we said, it's if I match this, I do that. Or if I match something else, I do something else. So we, re we return back to our proto all stuff. Oh crap. Thanks, Eclipse. And the new stuff we introduce is this when. I will start with this one. Oh, well, I will start with the first one. When I match a terminal variable tag, I want you to do something strange, I will explain to you later, that has to do with something which is called protostate. And if I match a terminal of whatever else, okay, so if it's not a variable, I assume it's constant of whatever types, well, just return the value of the terminal. Okay. So this stuff is something that say, oh, when you will execute this stuff, when you match a terminal of whatever, which is not a Bible tag, just look inside the terminal and give me it, oh, where is my copy time casket? So, at one time, I will look into my terminal and fetch the value which is stored inside and return it to whatever code me. And otherwise, in all the other cases, well, just do what you're supposed to do as an operator. Okay. And if you find another node in your exploration of the operator's evaluation, well, just call evaluate again. So, what does it mean? If I add something like x plus 3 going into this, we match a plus. So it's not a terminal of variable tag, not a terminal of whatever, so it's otherwise something else. Oh, what does plus do by default? Oh, I call a small function that say, oh, I have two stuff to evaluate and I will do a plus on this. But how do I evaluate my other parts? Oh, well, I call evaluate on each of my subtree. So I call evaluate on my left hand side, which is x. x is a terminal of variable tag. And I will go there. Well, we will see whatever it means. I will retrieve a value somehow. And I go into the other one, which is 3, and 3 is a, a terminal of whatever. What? Give me this value. Oh, it's 3. Okay, so I make plus between 3 and whatever this stuff returned to me. And I will return to the result of this. Oh, crap, I just evaluated x plus 3. Now, how can I pass my variable value? Because, as we, if we remember, variable tag is just an empty structure that doesn't do anything. Well, State is basically something we can pass <coughs> as an additional parameters to the transform when we call it at runtime. time. And basically state just say, okay, if you have a state which has passed but when you call that, just return whatever value is it. And so basically, what we say there is yeah, yeah. It's basically what we say, you know, with our voice a bit better. Oh, it's a variable, give me its value. If it's another value, give me its value. And if not, do whatever regular operators does. Plus does plus, minus does minus, etc. And so is I only need it. Ten lines? Okay. This ten lines basically evaluates whatever operation you want. Okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, now is the point to have questions. First one, so um, Bruce boost proto underscore. Right? So does it mean anything? It's anything that a terminal of Whatever crap. Okay, so does, does that mean that the order in which you describe yes. it, this matter? Yes, it's order okay. dependent. There is no magic there. Okay. It goes this way. Okay. Uh, of course, if you do this, you're screwed. Okay. <laughs> so beware. What I should have done, and it's my own fault, I should have basically replicated as the stuff we have seen before in the grammar, you know, or int, or float, or double. Yeah. Okay, because this is what we need to do. Okay, but I wanted to introduce you to uh, proto underscore, okay? And anyway, is it, re is it really necessary to check again that we have an int of proto or double? No, because if we evaluate something, that means that this something has been constructed, so that means it's already validated the grammar. So I don't need to test this again, okay? I have something that constructs my expression, and I will feed it to this stuff. We will see a bit after what how it works. But if I have been able to construct it, it means that Domain always says, yeah, it's matches grammar, continue and go on. So we know that the stuff we will pass through this already matches the grammar. So we don't have to do more checks. Well, if you are 
People also like to have a belt and some, uh, what's the name of this stuff, you know? Yeah. If you want to have multiple belts, you could check again. Okay. Yeah, belt and suspender, sex. So if you're more belt and suspender guy, you can recheck there. But usually, it's not needed. And, well, we save some quite of microseconds of computer time. And otherwise, just say, yeah, if you don't match anything, just pull it through this stuff. So there is another question over there. You answered it. Okay, done. <laughs> okay. So Do you have one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, I knew this. It's because you're, you're uh, yeah. just switching your head quickly. Uh, <laughs> But but this this whole thing is, is a compile time thing. Right? It's both. It's a polymorphic I, function object. I know, I know, I know. So so when you were explaining, yeah, pointing at these things, yeah. you actually were explaining the runtime process. How the operator function right. call is constructed. Yes, exactly. For this particular type. When the plan and the particular expression times. Right. For this particular type. You so so there is a lot of magic going on. Oh no, it just I mean it just it just a polymorphic function object calling itself. Magic is this. You basically have your expression times coming in, and you basically you look at the tag of your first node and you check where is it. And when you have found where is it, you call the function which is there. And you pass it to your okay, expression. Okay, but, but what, and really, you do this what really thing. happens is that this or yeah. boost brother or yeah. has Operator parentheses, parentheses that say that does check on whatever <coughs> the expression pass as a parameter match. No, but this this thing has been checked already at compile time. Wait, right? Yeah, it does. Is it? Yes. But basically, so it, 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 it already yeah, knows runtime now. which one to. Yeah, yes. At runtime, it already knows. Yeah, but at runtime, you only have the one that matches, that's, which is actually compiling code. Mm -hmm. So it picked one of the operators. Yes, at compile time. time. Yeah, okay. And it does this recursively until it eats up all the trees, mm -hmm. and it compiles this into some kind of automatic composition of all what's going on there. I don't have the tools that I need on this, but if you were looking at the assembly code uh, generated by the application of this onto a given expression like a per, uh, x plus x divided by two, what you would say is some uh, floating point load. Add divide divide store, right. which is basically what you mm -hmm. uh, expect it to be, and basically this is a way to actually describe some kind of arbitrary type-driven function compositions. This is the conditions of the composition, and this is the actual function you want to call because this and this are actual function objects. Too. But in general, when you are evaluating operator plus, yes, you will be calling operator std plus of whatever. Yeah, we would call plus on the evaluation of whatever. Yeah, we have a small have, function yeah. that does this. Right. So, so you'll be making function calls. Yeah. Left and right. Yeah. But it's yeah. all in line. It's all yeah. templates. So everything gets in line, and everybody okay. uh, lives happy ever after. Uh, you've been <laughs> conceptually describing this as like a recursive descent yeah. cursor. But does it get unrolled? Is it flattened out for what the code is actually generated? Uh, you mean? Uh, if if what? the if the call to evaluate in yeah. your, in your otherwise yeah. results in a call to the minus operator. Yes. If we generate the call for calling the polymorphic function object which does a minus, which would be fed with the call to evaluate on both of the children. That will re enter the new stuff. Okay. Basically. And Inlining doing what inlining is supposed to do, everything is squished into and, and also you, you are using the word polymorphic in an overloaded oh. way, right? Static polymorphic. Static polymorphic. It's basically, it's basically a function where all the it's attributes are It's not a are virtual templates. function. It's not a virtual function. We are not dealing with no. this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really po I mean, it's polymorphic in the static sense of the term. Basically, everything there models the boost result of protocol. So you have a huge parenthesis operator with template T1, T2, T3, T4, Tn, and you match everything using templates. There is no uh, runtime polymorphism involved in this. Mm -hmm. We could have worked the same stuff, but with whatever cost at runtime we have. And yeah, in landing being what it is, everything gets in line, and usually uh, this kind of stuff doesn't prevent any kind of uh, compiler, op compiler optimization being done. Uh, we had a very nice surprise in our tools where we were working on stuff like this 
and we were working, our terminals were small uh, four floats uh, booster array. Okay. And we ended up looking at the, uh, well, we do some bench, and uh, instead of going at the same speed as the regular code, we were basically four times faster. We were like, what the heck? And by looking at the assembly code, well, it's not probably like everything, and it matches, oh, it's a pack of four floats, let's vectorize all this shit. And it's basically generated automatically <laughs> a vectorization of what Frodo was outputting. And we are like, oh, okay. What and at this it? point, we said, okay, we don't have to vectorize this shit ourselves, the compiler does it, so sets. Uh, so it basically no, doesn't prevent any stuff. No, yes. Which compiler? Uh, GCC 4.4 .4 and uh, MSVC, I never remember the date, uh, 7 something, so it should be 2005. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we are like. seven is 2003. Yeah. Also, oh, it should be, <coughs> it should be eight then, because Proto doesn't work with anything below uh, MSVC eight, or it tries but well. So basically, this is this is relatively well defined, and it's basically what I call the uh, you know, uh, it's like the shades, you know, it's double blades. So you can do whatever I what I call high level semantic driven optimization using Proto because you can fit it some kind of tree to this kind of stuff. And there we just evaluate the function value, but we can transform your tree into whatever else, and then generate code. And after that, the compiler comes again and says, oh, what's going on? There is code I didn't optimize yet. And we optimize it, and end the days normally. Basically, it's like you were compiling your files, and at some point you fall into Proto stuff. Proto takes all of the compilers, and basically tells him what he has to do piece by piece. And what is done, we say, Proto say, okay, now you can finish whatever crap you have to do on this code. And everything is done in a way that basically stuff is going done. And in some cases where everything is pawned and stuff, and you have this kind of situation where if you were writing this by hand, the compilator tool I've seen that it has to do something else, it does something else. Sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it does. So usually, well. We are, still we are still trying to find a way where protocol is slower than the same stuff written by N by a significant margin. Let's say more than 10 or 12 percent. And usually it's basically the same that if you are writing the same crap by hand. And when you look at the assembly code, everything is basically done. Uh, gone, sorry. And you only have whatever you want to stuff in general. So now the question is, how can I fit this to this transform and how do I use this as a transform itself? So basically, everything else is the same. We don't touch anything there. We don't touch anything to the grammar, and this is very important. We don't touch anything to the analytical expression except its operator parenthesis. Well, I said the evaluate was some kind of polymorphic function object, so I instantiate it, and I just call it with this, which is a current expression. So the first parameter of a proto-transform is the expression to transform. And there is two additional parameters. So you can call it like this. It works. Well, you can pass a second parameter which is a state, which is a mutable variable that you can modify going through your uh, transform. And look at what I pass. As the parameters I pass to my parenthesis operator when I call my x plus 3 of 4. And the 4 goes there, 4 goes there, and the proto state function is made so, oh yeah, I will look where I store this to get my value each time I call state. Okay. And you can have a third parameter for constant additional information we call data. And all original you can fetch in your transform using proto underscore data, which is for trans transporting uh, constant information about what's going on in the transform. Uh, there is an example in the uh, proto documentation which is about having a lazy string classes that doesn't uh, perform any uh, operation when you concatenate it. concatenate it. And when you actually put it into a string, it uses data to get uh, the raw string to use as a root for concatenating. Or there is another one where you actually pass a local to do a transformation of string to double root string and stuff like this. Usually most of the transform work like this. When you need to get some information as non additional values, where to store data, whatever, you usually use states. And when you, when you need both the, var the variable stuff and the constant stuff, you can pass a certain one. And you can pass whatever. So if you need multiple states, just make a tuple and it's done. Okay. 
And if you make one bit of your data, do the same. Okay, you can pass whatever. If you don't pass anything, there is something that takes care of that. And so this say, okay, I will prime a transform evaluate on whatever expression I am using this as a state. And what's the type of this? Well, it's an analytical expression of something. And in the same way the something gets extracted when we match a grammar, the something is extracted to match the step of the transform. Okay. And even if our IST is embedded in our analytical expression, it gets matched through the transform steps. Okay? Okay, can, can you? Yeah. <laughs> can you go back a little bit? Yeah. So, so, uh, you want to go up on the transform, maybe? Um, or is there? Well, well I, I'm just wondering where, again, Compile time, run time. Okay. Right? So, so what happens? So evaluate. Was there? Okay, was there evaluate, a compile time? Okay. Evaluate seems like to be one type that yes, does not it is. depend on on the. It doesn't depend on anything. It takes the IST as a parameter <coughs> of its own polymorphic function called overload operator. And what the transform declaration does, yeah. it, this actually is used to build. What is inside this parenthesis operator? And inside this operator, basically, this has or gives us a, a function overload operators that say, try this or this or that and call it. And every time you match, do whatever is there. So at compile time, the type of this gets through this. It gets through the or. And depending on what the type of the top is, it gets somewhere and call it again with whatever is behind and you do it recursively at open time until it basically generated all the steps needed to perform whatever so it operation is through on this your runtime object mm -hmm. at open time it's look at the type of your expressions and select the actual chain of function code you will need to make at runtime but, but the compile time it has no information it has because in the expression types uh -huh. You have the tag of your topmost node. And this is what drives the transform. Whenever you match... Okay, you lost me. Okay, let's go back. This, is, this seems like a very important point. It is. Right. So, let's make a small drawing again. So, let's say you want to evaluate x plus 3, okay? Same way as before. Where is the stuff? So, you, you write this. So, basically, the type of this is something like analytical expression of. Proto expression of, I will just write it like this, plus, okay, which is a type that say I have a plus, and my, I have two arguments which are mm -hmm. uh, a analytical expression of, proto expression of, uh, uh, terminal of zero arguments that contains a variable type. Right. And my second argument for my plus is the same thing with not terminal, which is an integer. Yeah. Okay, this is my compact time type of this. Yes. And now, next to that, so I know that I will have to generate an, an object of this type. And what I do is that I build an instance of evaluate, and I do C of this. Okay, and I pass whatever state is, let's say 4. So I have to compile that. For compiling that, I have to resolve what's going on in this operator. So let's look at evaluate and try to find its overloaded operator's function call. Where does it come from? Well, we have nothing there. So it comes from what's going on in this. So basically... So, you, so your operator function call yeah. is a huge template. Oh yeah, which yeah. is built by this all this combination. Right. And at compile right. time, what does it so, does? So evaluate is just one struct. Yeah, that but it has a humongously over. You can even operation. say you can even say ugly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I once I try to get in, inside this so I can actually get the uh, you know the your uh, unrolling of what the stuff calls. Uh, it's a bit ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does it does? Basically post protocol as this among us operator overload. Let's say, okay, I'm taking the tag of the expression that is passed in my parameters and I look where it fits. 
And why I found it, I found the time, because it's all dependent on the time of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, I'm here. Oh, well, I need to call this. And I will say, okay, call operator parenthesis on that. Mm -hmm. And what does this stuff does? Well, it has an operator parenthesis, the exact same thing, but it knows that it gets a terminal and says, okay, give me your value, and I return that. Does the same for the other stuff. <coughs> it goes there and basically call our small function object that do the plus. And basically, it's, it's done like this. Oh, I need to match a plus. So I will call, let's say, do plus. And on what? Well, on evaluate of left there and the right. Okay, yeah, but what is it? I need to know what stack and what stuff I need to do this mm -hmm. to get this. So let's go again yeah. and evaluate. No, this, this is not clear. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> no, 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 I mean. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the, the main thing that I wasn't understanding yeah. is, is that the operator is the, the, the evaluate is just one. It's so so where, where does the compiler, during compile time, time where, when is this evaluation done? It's done when you are trying to match that's operator it, yes. parentheses. Yes. At this that's point, where, that's, that's where they at compile time, time you go through yeah, this okay. description and recursively you peel off parts of the expression until you eat everything. And for each type of tag you match, you generate the actual function calling you. And you do this until you eat all the tags and all the tree. And you end up with a huge composition of this function, and you just pass through this thingy at one time. That's, what, that's something I'm asking for a lot of time for, from compiler guys. Give us something which is the equivalent of minus big E for the preprocessors, for the template instantiation, please. So we can actually have some kind of pre instantiation pre instantiated template output so we can look what's going on. Right. Well, they say, yeah, make a patch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say, no sense. So, yes. A couple of more questions. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, right. So this evaluate structure does not have, at this point, does not have anything to do with uh, anything yep. else. It's only by itself, right? Yes. So when it evaluates, uh, so for example, it gets the default evaluate, goes back into evaluate. So my transform could want to do something that's specific to analytic expression. Yes. All right. So how do I tie that back in here? Oh, well, what you can do is that at some point you can say, instead of this, for example, let's say we have something more complex going on, and in your, let's say in your analytical function grammar, you have members of another grammar called foo. Okay. And when you encounter a foo, whatever the foo is, because foo is a full grammar, so it can be as complex as it can, you want to say, yeah, do something. You can just say, when foo, do something. Okay. Because a grammar is something that matches something, so you can put it there. So let me ask yeah. a simpler question. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Because so when in the boost proto, otherwise the last clause, yes. okay, else clause. Yes. Um, so you have default the value. Yeah. Right? So in that case, let's say I I want everything to be. So if it's a plus b, I want a plus b. But if it's a minus b, I want to do something special. I want to actually do a plus b again. Well, all right. So you can, you can put something there. All right. You say okay. when plus then do something else. Okay, the do something else is I have to create another structure for that, right? No, 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 no. You can ju you just put it there. Well, I have an example of that right after. Okay. We will add. Okay. In the next step, we will add sinus and cosinus to this. Okay. Uh, just for the game. All yes. Right. So, so second question is. Um, drawing a blank here. All right. So you got when we when we instantiated this. Yeah. So with evaluate has no yeah, 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 no yeah. no constructor arguments, but you call its operator with. Uh, it's, it's function call operator with uh, the analytical expression, a yeah. reference to the analytical expression. Okay. Yes. Um, is that reference stored anywhere in here? <coughs> made use of. Oh, Just, uh, if you, for example, there, if you use proto underscore, uh -huh. it represents your expression you are currently matching. I see. So you can pass it to whatever race you want. So can you modify the state of the analytical expression? Uh, you can. Okay, that'd be stupid. But you okay. can. Uh, I will not advise you to do so for a lot of reasons. Uh, the first is that I really like when this kind of stuff is actually functional and if you want to modify your expression, just return a new one. Because it's so bloody uh, lightweight that you won't cost anything. Anyway. And, well, there is some very specific cases where you need to do something like uh, do some crap on the expression to modify it on the fly in the middle of the evaluations. Uh, well, don't do that at all, please. Because, well, it's, it, it works, but, well, uh, it's not meant to be so. 
because it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like, you know, well, I think we can find a way to write a transform that basically has the same problems that, look, when you know you have containers, you take iterators on this, and you uh, delete elements in the containers, and you try to get the iterators still valid. So you may end up with stuff that basically blow up the old stuff and never terminates because you will keep adding stuff and keep you know, running each time. You know, like, okay, when I have this, I take this and I make this plus this, for example, and I want to evaluate that again. And in fact, you can have a loop where you construct a never-growing expression that never terminates to evaluate. So I advise against trying to modify stuff in the middle of the evaluation. Okay. But you can try. If we want to have two variables, is there something we have to change? Ah, this is the next step. <laughs> I have one more question. Okay, yes. I'm just going to It's, it's a de design question about yeah. the design of Proto. Oh, whoa. Well. Be be because here, here when, you, when you define and evaluate, you, have, you, have, you actually have two choices. You can either do this overloading yeah. of uh, the templatizing of the operator yes. function call, yes. or you could templatize the, the whole struct. Yes. Right? You could pass it an yes. ASP tree. As a parameter of the right. transform. Is there a reason? I, I think there is a reason, and I think Eric tried to explain it. The to thing me. is that it's more simple to pass a non template classes as a parameter of something else first, because transform are completely independent on what they will be mm -hmm. uh, evaluated. So if you wanted to pass a, f uh, a transform as, a f as an argument of the whatever, and it was a function, a template type, you can because class T doesn't match template class class T. Okay. And, it's, and having a polymorphic function object, which is itself a template, has little use because all the information from the template is basically something you can catch into the operation call. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And these things make us able to reuse and evaluate in a lot of different cases. There is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm lying, there is actually one case where having a, a template drama or template transform is useful is when you have to get an external information that has no way to deal with either the expression, the state, or the data, and it dramatically changes the way the evaluation is done, which is basically a way to get some kind of externally uh, um, extendable transform. You can say, yeah, if I, have, if I have passed whatever there, you do this, but if I pass whatever, you do that, and whatever some other users want to define, it can define a new type and specialize evaluation, evaluate and do something different. But it happens where very, very scarce. That's the same thing that uh, that Hartmut saw this morning, right? For uh, specializing uh, for underscore yeah, or, something uh, like this. parallel. Exactly. This basically is this. And it's actually the only use case where it makes a lot of sense. Yes? Is, is there any way to cross the runtime compile time boundary with the actual expression? Yeah. Because we have to parse the expression at runtime but we have all the underlying components at compile time. That's the piece that still doesn't make sense. Well, in fact, you don't pass it at runtime. You pass it at compile time because all is based <coughs> on the type of the tags. No, but can, can we actually break that boundary where the user can supply yeah. the runtime? We, we have to use Spirit to actually build the, yeah. the runtime tree with the underlying compile time stuff that's already been done. You can. Uh, I will commonly say, we can talk about that with Arbot and you will basically explain this better than me. But you can do this. And it's basically what happened in, in uh, oh, what's the name of the library? Expressive. Yes, it is. It's basically what happened in Expressive. You have some kind of stuff that prepare at compile time some things that will be done at runtime with a real-time parser. Yeah. And you can basically do this. And there is a lot of time when it actually makes sense because <laughs> Yeah, you want to do a transform, but you can't do it because you need information at runtime. Okay, there's a transform generate the uh, stop code that we do with the whatever at runtime. I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, uh, concretely, a uh, use case would be named objects. You know, object 1 plus object 2. Could, could, could you just speak a bit louder because I'm deaf as a, as a whole? So. Oh, no worries. Yeah. I'm thinking, uh, so a use case would be where you were using a matrix example. Yeah. And I want the user to be able to actually enter matrix 1 times matrix 2. Yes. And so at runtime, I would build a wrapper <coughs> yes. that basically had a name and a reference to an underlying matrix type that yes. was passed into this code. Yes. So would that be spirit or exp I mean expressive? No, no, I mean, it's, it's this. If you build something that depends on the type at runtime, it's at comma time, it's all compile time. I don't know where the runtime part is in your stuff. Um, the question. 
But Parsing the actual expression. But why do you want to do this at runtime? Because you have all the information about the structure of the IST at compile time. Um. You see what I mean? So, so the structure of the IST is encoded into time, so there is nothing left to parse at runtime. Okay. Because, well, there is nothing at runtime. I mean, it should have disappeared. Well, you could make a transform that turns the tree into a string that contains something that represents the type into a string and pass it at runtime. You can do that. So essentially, the C++ compiler is doing the yeah, parsing you actually, for you. And you're actually tricking the, the compiler to compile another language while thinking it compiles itself. Basically. And it doesn't see anything going on. So, let's see if this works. So, how many is it? It should be uh, 6.5, if I'm not mistaken. So, we basically do the same and we call the operator there and we go over there. Okay, and just to check it's not stage, I will actually modify the, the expression afterwards. Just go, yeah, it's all done already. So, nothing in the, nothing we compile. Uh, did I compile the correct one? Yes. <coughs> yeah, 6.5. Oh, well. So, yeah. Let's multiply all this stuff by 10, okay? And, well, divide by x squared. Well, it won't start to be a bit complex, but whatever. Yeah, it's okay. So let's recompile. No, oh, yeah, I compiled again, <laughs> come on. Just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it should be that. Uh, yeah, it should be 65 divided by 4. Yeah, so it's like this. Okay, well, this is done. So now at this point, in what? Yeah, let's say less than 100 lines counting comments. Well, we basically have the equivalent of the uh, product calculator examples. Okay, but we basically we wrote like this. So now, okay, what if I want more variables? What should we do? How can we do this? Let's see if you can see what we can do. I want to have, let's say, three variables, x, y, z. And I want to be able to say, when I get x, I take the first uh, variable. If I get a y, I take the second one, etc., etc. Your state will have to be a list of three variables. Yeah, or tuple, or whatever. Yeah. And what should we change the transform? In the transform, we have to find a way to not score that fast, to extract, extract. the correct value from the state, depending mm -hmm. on which variable is it. And we have to do this at compile time, because we want to match something there. So you would have to have three tags. We can have two <coughs> tags, or we can have variable tag of, of 0, 1, 2, 5, 0, 1, 2, 5 0, 1, 2, 5, 0, 1, 2, 5, And, well, it would be a bit more complex to write there. And in fact, what can we put there? We can put any callable object of our own design. So what we will do, we will make a small callable object. Let's say, I'm getting a state, I'm getting the terminal numbers, and I will extract the correct values, and I will just send it back to brother. Okay? So we have a few stuff to change. We have to change the way the variable tag is defined. How we pass the state, and we have to Work on this. How does it look? Let's go. Yeah, so macro blah blah. So, what I do is I change my variable tag to be like this. I have a table parameter there, which will, I will inherit there. And what I will do is that I will inherit from something like npm in 0, np in 1, etc. So, I have to modify my grammar because now this is a template classes. So I say, if I have a terminal of variable tag of whatever, okay, I, I match this, okay. So we just update the grammar, so now the variable tag is a template. Okay, so the other stuff is basically the same. We have the small in front double stuff. We have all the operators, so we just have changed the variable tag definition. Okay, now what's going on? Well, I speak a lot. So, how we do it in the other way around? Okay, so what we want is that, okay, when we have, I don't know what, I'm calling the default stuff. <laughs> when I have a constant, I return the value, and, well, 
When I have a terminal which is a variable tag of whatever, what do I do? Well, I'm extracting the value. This will give me this, this type, okay, this value. And I get the state, which will be our tuple. And I, well, look at this strange stuff. How does it look? It looks like a function call. Well, the joke is a bit old because I guess Eric did it last year and the year before and the year before before. So this is basically what? It's a function type which can be read as a function that takes this and that and return this. Okay, and we use it as a compact way to say, I want to call that using this argument. Okay. So, when I have this, I'm getting the value and I'm getting the state. And I'm calling this callable object, passing in these arguments. And what's going on in fetch variables? Yeah, let's go. Look. It's basically a payable object that follows the result of protocol. Nothing fancy. And what do we do? Well, I have an basically I will receive an index and some variables. I remove reference, if any, on the variables, so I can get the type inside. And basically what I will put in the variables is some kind of containers, maybe a boost array or something. So I know I can retrieve the const reference type inside. Okay. And what happens when I actually call the operator? I got my index, I got my vars, v, and what I, oh yeah, give me v brackets index value. Why? Because index would be some kind of MPL integral constant that would uh, contain the uh, index of corresponding to the variable. And there is something new there, which is this. Well, I have to say that fetch variable is a proto callable object. Why? Because we have to find a way to make the difference between transform when we want to call a function, which is some type, parenthesis, some values, and what, what we want to do is build a new object, calling this constructor, which I give it to you, it's type, some variables inside parents. So, by inheriting from Bruce proto callable, we tell proto, okay, when you encounter fetch variable somewhere in the transform, don't try to instantiate it. Try to call its operator parentheses instead. So this basically has some kind, same trick. Small type devs that get matched by products, they say, okay, I have to call this and not try to build it. Okay? And so what happens now is that when you go through this transform, what happened? Oh, come on. What happens? Well, you match this, and say, okay, let's extract the value from my terminals, which will be something, and get the state, which is our container containing all the variables values, and call operator parentheses on this. And Proto will automatically instantiate the um, value of this, and calling operator parentheses on that, passing this. Okay. And this is how we can actually get, okay, I have an arbitrary stuff going on in my expression, I dissect it somehow, and I call an arbitrary function on it. We could have done the very same thing there, but saying, okay, if I match a plus, let's call std plus of something else. We could have done that. Okay, but it's irrelevant because we have this, but if we do have, we could have say, okay, let's take whatever callable object we have and call it, passing it through whatever variables. So this relatively alien notation, okay, is some kind of trick played on the way we can describe function types in C++ to actually say, okay, I want to call this and that. And as Eric says, this is basically a DSL inside a DSL framework to build a notation for function call. Okay. So I don't know if any of you uh, know about, what's the name of this uh, stupid emissions? Uh, Pimp My Ride. Pimp My Ride, the stuff where the guys make new cars and stuff. You know, and the guy has, it's bad bit to put completely strange stuff into cars. So, uh, and his punchline is something, oh yeah, we learn you like this and we put this in your car. So basically, yeah, we learn you like compilers. So we put a compiler in your compiler so you can compile while you compile. Okay? <laughs> so basically this. So we have this small trick going on there so we can actually uh, have a compact way to write this. Uh, and I have bad news for our fellow uh, Microsoft Visual Studio users. Oh, it doesn't work. So for Visual Studio user, you have to put this into something which is called proto 
column, column core, which is template stuff, but we've wrapped the function object there. Okay. One word of advice, do it every time so it works on whatever, whatever uh, compiler. Uh, I think it got better with uh, the latest one with the uh, service pack, but I'm not sure I have to check. Last time I checked on the bug report, the guy from Visual Studio said, yeah, yeah, we know about the bug, but it's not fixed. So, so if you want to be uh, kind with Proto, just upvote the bug report until they stop saying not fixed. So this is a transform. We just change this. We write this small stuff there. I will say, yeah, get me the value which contains the index and give me the state and I will give you whatever value outside the index. And so what's going on afterwards? Analytical expression, same crap, doesn't change. Again, separation between what's going on in the transform and what's going on into the AP side. And we write our operators. So now we have three because we can call for one, two, or three variables. We could I make a macro and call for whatever amount, okay? And what do we do? Well, when I have exactly one um, uh, arguments for my call, I build an array of one double, I put the value inside, and I pass this, that, sorry, as my state. <laughs> if I have two, I pass one, and two, etc., and go on and go on. So we just aggregate all the arguments there into this kind of array, tuples, container stuff. And how do we define x, y, z? Well, it's a bit more complex. So it's what? It's an analytical expression of a terminal of variable tag of what? Something that gives me the index. <coughs> so we decide arbitrarily that x is 0, <coughs> y is 1, and z is 3. It's 2, sorry. And uh, yeah, it should go on over It's not there. that arbitrary because this, these are the indexes in your. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean it's, a, it's a choice. We could have right. made whatever choice. I mean, it's not something that proto force you to do this But way. you use them as indexes. Yeah, we use them as indexes, and what it does is that this match this. We could have been very, you know, uh, vicious or whatever and shuffling whatever stuff and so on, but what? Well, let's make it straightforward. <laughs> so we embed the index corresponding to this there into the type of the variable tag, and we make a terminal out of it and put it into our expression types, etc. Again, the strong point is we change the way the grammar is constructed, it doesn't change much on the transform, except for the extra calls, because we need this. And we generally have to change there, and in the expression we just have to change the actual semantic part of the expression. We don't, we don't give a crap about what's going on in the grammar. We just change the way the semantic is implemented. And this separation is really important, because it's what helps us get calls that looks like something a human can actually read. Oh, come on, how is it not like this? So, and what's going on? Well, now I can write this. x times 3 plus 1 over y, with x equal to 2 and y equal to 0 plus 1. Is there a reason why you have to use MPL int? Oh, no, you could have used whatever you want to. No, but, but ah. you could use integer. Like, you could parameterize. Everything. No, because you can't. We, we need the index as. Well, no. We could have put an integer inside and construct x, y, z by constructing them with a runtime value for an index. And in the fetch variable, sorry, instead of doing v of index dot dot value, it will be v of i, because i would have been the integral value. No, I, what I meant is, is you, could, you could have uh, a template that's parameterized by an int. Yes, but how do you just compile that int? int. But that's what it is. Oh, yeah, you mean directly, uh, directly template, yeah, I don't because, well, let's compile, and while it compiles, I will show you. There is no way, well, there is a way, but the problem is that I have to put something there that means whatever in value. Uh. And in fact, there is one, we have boost proto big M. Okay. But, well, I prefer this, mm -hmm. but that's personal uh, text. We have boost proto big N that can be a placeholder for whatever integral types. But I'm not a fan of having integer and types mixed into my meter function because it's all mm -hmm. crampy. And the other stuff is that if I have but if I have a class which has non-type parameters, I can't write a lambda fu a meta function from it. Because I can't put boost underscore anywhere in the integral part. That's well, personal taste. You could it could have worked. Yes, it could have worked. 
I think the first version of this I actually did like that. But uh, for whatever reason, I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. So what does it give us? It should be, yeah, 60. Uh, what? what? Oh, yeah, it's what? Yeah, yeah it's 6 good. plus 1 yeah. over 1 10. So yeah, it's 60. Okay. Yeah, it was like, what the heck? But no, it's correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, so now we went a step further. We have multiple variables. We have a simple way to actually fetch whatever. Uh, you could simply wrap, wrap everything from the uh, declaration of the variables and the operators parentheses to have some kind of boost PP repeat going on if you want to go up to whatever number of variables. So now, okay, I've, we have played with, I have to check what time is it because I'm going to eat the world. And I, how many times? Six. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Oh, okay. I think it was in the past five and a half. Like, oh, <laughs> okay, we played with operators. Yeah, except there is not only operators that you're actually interested in. What if I want to make a lazy function? Like, I want to have cosinus or sinus in this stuff. Or I want my transpose and my matrix to be lazy or whatever. Because the actual, uh, sorry, <coughs> the actual syntax of my DSL I try to put into C++ has some function somehow. So, how do we do this? Well, what's, what can be a lazy function? If I wanted to write cos as a lazy function, what should it do? It should just output a node in the IST which has a tag called cos something, and which has a common number of arguments. And that's all. And in the grammar, we would have to check, oh, there is a cos tag with something going on. And in the evaluation, oh, there is a cost tag again, let's call it cost, or something else. And to, for doing this, there is two ways. There is, uh, well, rather manual way to do that, which is actually having to write function calls that means your <coughs> crap proto expression tree with all the enabled crap, which should be around 50 lines. Or make it 100. Or we can go through what's intended to do this. So, same stuff. But now what we do is we actually define empty struct. Okay. Let's say, okay, there is a cost in this in my nodes and there is a sinus in my node. What's going on next? We will do is we will make a simple function that co actually computes the cost itself. So it's just a function object that wrap STD cost. Okay. Just that. So I went a bit general because I wanted to add more functions afterwards. So I have a generic compute classes that takes a tag and I do whatever. So if I wanted to add tangent or power, I just had to add the tag and specialize this small fun uh, function object. So what do I do? I take a, something inside and I'm calling, I turn it into a double and I'm calling cos in it and I'm returning the double. And for sinus, no surprise, I do the same and I call sinus. Well, and should, now, should we ask what Danny is for? Oh yeah, it's just a pet peeve of mine. Uh, it's just that I don't want to have a lot of complete template instantiation because of bunch of compile time. And so I like to have this dummy type there so I can still have a non-complete specialization there. So the compiler doesn't compile this until it actually needs it. That's a small trick. Well, it, it works without. It just I I I have the habit to do this, and I think I just brought it by you know, reflex. But look, it looks a lot like the fetch variable stuff we wrote earlier. Except look, what the heck? Where is my proto header over there? Right. Yeah, where is it? What the heck? Well, the way we detect that a, a type is proto header doesn't work with template classes. Blend the compiler. Because you, can, uh, you can't actually ask stuff like uh, boost MPL as XX on uh, non complete types for whatever reason in the context we are. So we can't actually have proto calable there. So what do we do? Well, there is an is calable proto uh, meta function, so we just and specialize it completely. So you can open the boost proto namespace and just say, yeah, compute of whatever, whatever is calable. So if you have a template transform, uh, sorry, if you have a template function object you want to use inside the transform, 
you can just make it inherit from Frodo Cabo for shenanigans reasons. And you have to specialize this color. Just a detail. Now, how do I build this node? Because it's, we are all there for that. So, here is what I would do. It's not that big. There is a new player in the game, which is Mechat. And as its name implies, it makes expression. And what does it do? It takes the tag of your expression to be built. And the list of all the arguments and how you want them to be stored. Either by reference to constant stuff, or if you put this by value, or by non const reference, whatever. You can choose there. And this is actually compute the, re the type of what happens when I make an expression with this tag and this as parameters. Well, you get the whatever proto expression types which has been there. It's all hidden there. And you call the function, which is in the proto namespace, not there. You pass the tags, the template parameters, and you pass all your arguments wrapped into CREF or REF or nothing, depending on if you store it by value, reference, or reference to constant. And this basically say when you call cost on whatever, and in fact, there, I said there's a whatever is actually something proto knows about. Then I will give you a new node in your IST with this as a node and this as children. If you pass something which is a, uh, a non-prototype, it will be wrapped into the terminal automatically. Okay. And everything will be set up so everything is kept as it should be kept. So this is for cost, so we have cost and look like what I say about operator press routers about legs. Is a uh, Overly overt, underdefined template because it cache whatever. And in fact, the whatever get reduced by this that actually check that it, that it can be applied on something which is proto based. Okay. And basically, you can make operator plus in your head, which is basically operator plus of R0 agua, make x plus R0 agua. And everything is wrapped into this stuff. And for the signers, well, you can see it coming, I guess. It's the same stuff with the scissors tag. And this is done. So there is one way to actually make function. There is another one you can check in the doc, which actually says, oh, I just make a terminal <coughs> of this type. And I instantiate it. That was Phoenix was doing, uh, Spirit was doing for a lot of time. Every function is Phoenix, uh, oh, come on. Every function is Spirit was a terminal in Prodo that has, as it was a Prodo terminal, it has an operator parenthesis, whatever. And in the grammar of spirit, we were matching cases where, oh, I have a terminal with something parenthesis afterward. So I take this, I take the stuff, and I call the function. The problem with this approach is that even if you don't use a function, you are paying complete time for actually building the instance of the terminal. And when you have one function, it's okay. When you have two, it's okay. When you start to having a lot, it's not okay. And usually, it stops. Uh, I think we, we, we experimented that. And above 20 functions, you basically go, your complete time goes like this, bah, and starts to be completely quadratic for whatever reasons. This is actually better because it's a template function and we get instantiated when we get actually called. So you only pay for what you actually call. So I prefer this so to, the other to the other one, yes. So, so these cosine and sine functions yep. are completely universal as far as I can tell. So if there are two EDSOs in there, yep. and you don't want one of them, how do I specify on the cosine and sine on a per EDSL basis? Sorry? So let's say there are two, two the, so there's uh, there's analytical function, right? So yeah. have, we have one set. Yeah. And uh, let's call metamorphic functions to be the other one. Yeah. All right. And both of them have sines and cosines. So you got to make sure that, the let's say the sign I want to evaluate, evaluate for one domain is different from the sign I want to evaluate for another domain. Yes. But this sign oh. tag will match everything, right? Yeah, except when it builds a node, what does Proto do? Look at this. Okay. Well, and it say, okay, you are an expression there, right? What is your domain? Okay. And I will build this expression in the same domain. So you will have different instances of the scene and cost node, each wrapped into an expression of the proper domain. And if you want to match one of the others, it's a work for the grammar. So how, how is this tied to the domain again? Have oh, well, have? in this stuff, we take this and we ask it, okay, give me your domain. Okay. And when you build this, we build an expression and we say, oh, your, 
you have to be constructed using this domain. So you get whatever you should have as an expression. Everything you pass something to make x, it will output an expression which is built using the actual domain of whatever stuff is going in. And if you have multiple arguments, it will take the common domain of both domains, if they are different, to compute with type of expression. This automatically takes care of asking the proper domain to generate the proper expression types. Sorry, I, I guess I'm missing something here. Yeah. So the R0 is completely independent. It's, it's yeah. three type, right? Yes. So R0 can be of any domain. Yes. All right. And we ask it. Where do we ask it? Make it call something which is called get yeah, domain. Make, make expression has, again has knows nothing about my domain. Yes. But it doesn't have to because you are building a naked IST there. When you are building an IST, you don't give a crap about the domain. It's when you will check the grammar that it's important. But when you build the node, you don't give a crap. You are just building ah, a node. Okay, okay. And you can build a valid node that can be go through the stuff, but at some point they will cross something that will check against the grammar. And at this point, you will say, no way. But so when you construct, you don't give a crap. You just construct. If not, what happens? We should, we should have needed to have an NW from this that checks that the type, the domain of this actually match the grammar of that, and we have made compute time completely uh, unusable. You never have to check if you are building an expression which is valid when you build it. It's the job for the grammar to check it. And what happens is that at some point you will cross the domain and the domain will do the check. But when you build the IST, you don't give a crap about what's going on. We ask you to put a node like this with this as a children, do that. Point. And all the check is done afterwards. If not, we, you will, we, will, we will be duplicating the, the work of the grammar there, and okay, we don't want that. Which means we can't use the same tag with two different. Uh, oh, yes, ideas. because it's just a tag in the tree. The fact that the tree is valid in the domain is a work to be done by the grammar. Yeah, but every tag has to have only one of these functions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is okay. unique, whatever right. the domain you use it. Because it's not the work of this to be actually matching over something. You can actually force Netflix to use a given domain if you really want it. Yeah. But usually you don't need that. Okay. And so what's going on afterwards? So sorry, one question. Yes. I'm I'm sorry, I still don't I still don't get it. We ask the arc zero for its domain. Yes. Now what if we write sign of three? Well has three Three domain? doesn't have any domains. Okay, so the get the get domain meta function will fail. This type can be computed. This means that this function can be used, be, be used as a double load because we are in a finite enable context. Okay. So it will be removed from the overloaded set and we certainly fall into normal STD costs. Okay. It's all driven by SFINAE anyway, at some point. Because okay. if we fail to construct this type, SFINAE says, okay, this function doesn't make any sense, don't look at it. Try to find another one. That's amazing. Thanks. That's FINAE. Well. <laughs> and hopefully it's there. If not, yeah, it would be a free mess. So we basically rely on the fact that if anything fails in this stuff, the so spinner will remove the function from the overload itself. And you would say, OK, I don't need this. Let's find something else. And you will find STD cost or whatever cost you may have defined. And everything will be work all right. Okay. Yeah. So you could add a dummy enable F to the end of it to specify just one. Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah, OK. You could, you could. Of course, you can do whatever you want there around. Like, yeah. I want this to be whatever, or. Okay. But usually you don't need because you will do this in the grammar at some point. Okay. Because you already build, you will rarely build expression tree for the sake of it. At some point, you will get fetched through the expression and the domain and change by grammar and stuff. So you don't, you, you should do the minimal stuff there. But you can have cases where you have a complex function there that need to. You don't store whatever stuff you have there, but. Before constructing the node, you may want to compute whatever and store the result of your whatever. So you can have co whatever you want there, exactly. And in this case, maybe you want to enable it on the actual non-expression parameters. But that's basically the only cases where it makes sense. Usually, you take the stuff, you build the node, and you ship it. And whatever grammar afterward will check whatever is going on. So, uh, yeah, we do a few cosmetic stuff. We want to add to our grammar that we want to check for cos and sinus. So we want to match what? A non-array expression which tag is cos tag and the argument is some member of identical function argument. So we could have written this directly, but I take the opportunity to 
show you this. You can actually write classes like this. Table time the grammar through so cos, and I need to read from unary x for cos tag grammar. And it's the same for sinus. And what I can write into my grammar, so the start is the same. And look. Oh, I'm taking the cos of an analytical function, which basically looks the same as this. Oh, I'm making a plus on an analytical function. So you can make this kind of small, you know, syntactic sugar classes to, okay, I have a new tag and I want to match what does this tag apply to what the grammar? You just need it from this. So in the reacts, match whatever expression with actually one argument with whatever tag. And basically, what is this? This inherits from, I give you, binary x of prototype plus whatever, whatever. Okay. So you can actually write stuff like this so your grammar doesn't look crumpy with all these low level details. So, what do we want to match? Our terminals, our variables, our operators, and cos and sine. Done. What should we do now? Transform. Transform, exactly. So, we upgrade the transform. Uh, well, so this is fetch variables, the same stuff. Everable and variate is this. Well, and this is, I, I don't remember who told me about that uh, when I show the otherwise stuff. I don't remember, was it you or. It was, yeah. We don't have any default for this. So we can go into the other one. So what we do is say, yeah, when I got a cost of whatever, I'm just going to compute with the cost. And what do I pass to the cost? Well, I evaluate whatever children he has. So I evaluate whatever my child is, and I pass it to compute. And this small stuff there, okay, child zero is actually giving the story up because you guess we have child one, child two, child three, whatever. This is basically a proto um, placeholder for, okay, I want to get the if um, child into my your expression dot. So if you have a, a unary node, you have child zero, that's all. If you have a binary node, you have child zero and child one. If you have a ternary node, child zero, child one, child two. And for uh, actual simplicity, when you have a binary node, instead of using child zero and child one, there is type def which is called left and right. So you can actually match, okay, I'm taking the left side of my binary or the right side of my binary. And we just basically do this, and if not, yeah, we jump again into a default. So what happens when we will cross the stuff again, when we will match something with a cost tag, we just call our cost tag function object we defined before. And as this stuff has been defined as callable, it will be called and not constructed. And everything is done right now. And basically this gives you how this stuff is done. Default say basically do this kind of stuff for whatever type of uh, tag it found for other binary and ternary cases. Okay, so it recursively call evaluate on itself. Oh well, the expression code is still the same. Doesn't change because it doesn't have. It doesn't change the operator there, still the same, still calling the same transform. We have our variable class and now we can do this. And look that I actually don't have, well, I could have put everything there into a namespace, okay? And problem is, uh, problem is made that it doesn't uh, break ADL, so I could have just called cost like this without anything going on. I would find to call it. So yeah, I would just compute the cosinus of uh, pi over 4, and some things that, if we are not mistaken, should be equal to 1. And look that I can freely mix this operators and whatever because of grammar says so. okay, where is the tree? Tack. Tack. Ah, of course. Mm -hmm. What did I do? Oh yeah, oh I like when you do this. Okay, what's going on? It was working as I would try. What did I do? Did I actually type something? That's a word. Oh, no, I, I did. Just don't read this. You'll never find out what I'm mistaken. No, see, I see what's going on. You do? <laughs> yeah. Look, look for the line that says error. <laughs> <laughs> Not much for a better one was there. With R0 equal to blah, 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 stuff. Okay. So, this means that at some point, you have the other one there. 
It's sinus this stuff times sinus this stuff. So I think I botched something in my transfer, in my model. I was testing it, it was working. You had to one at some point. Come on. Yeah, but you must have typed on something when you brought it up because the one that you distributed worked fine. Sorry? The solution you distributed worked fine. Yeah, you probably hit a key or something. You, you got to type it. Yeah, 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 I think it's it, but. Undo. Diff? Yeah, except not. <laughs> it works on your stuff. Okay, so I should have. What did, what crap did I do? Somebody so said hit undo. undo. Yeah, I, I did, but doesn't do anything. Save the file as an undo anymore. Yeah, well, I will grab it from somewhere. Well, it should work. <laughs> okay, I think I just, I should have made it. Ah, no, I know. Well, okay, not a problem. So, let's pretend it worked. <laughs> <laughs> now, the file works right. Which version of Proto do you use? 1.66 something? 1.4. Ah, well, I will investigate that, but it should work. I think it worked yesterday, so whatever. Well, so, MechX helps us build new nodes that we can wrap into some kind of... Um, no, I was using the, the pre-release one. But they just, they, they gave up. Oh, so it's trunk, basically. Yeah, well, let's try this trunk. It's, it's that funky release thing that they put Yeah, out. yeah, but it's basically whatever it was there. Yeah, well, whatever. Okay. It should be working. Yeah, if I, if I build it with 144, it cramps up like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, this maybe means that... No, okay, well, I will check, whatever. I should have forgot something in the grammar. So, make expert press build a new way to generate new nodes. Okay. Funky stuff is that, I don't see it there, but if you want, you can actually uh, Re-overload <coughs> yourself, your operators, and making them output different tag, if you really want it. Don't do this, but you can. Usually, you better serve by creating new functions. Uh, you can actually have methods from your uh, expression class generate new nodes. Like, for example, uh, you could have, again, people will say I'm, I'm being scenario, but let's say we have all again our uh, magic stuff, and you have your matrix expression n, and you can want to say, okay, I want to write transpose of n, but I want to write n dot transpose. And what does this should do? It will return a mechx of whatever the node of transpose is, and where the actual argument will be this. So it works wherever you want, not in, only in the function. Okay? So with this, basically we have a way to generate whatever other syntax part of your DSL. This is the over automatic overloading of the operators that can cover much of your needs. So now, okay, uh, what about jumping a bit more on the transform side? What if I wanted to compute the analytical derivatives of this kind of expressions? Can I do it at complete time? The answer is yes. Why? Because what happens? Let's, let's do the same exercise for, that for the evaluation process. I have an expression that basically represents an analytical function, and I want to compute its derivatives. Well, if I find a constant, I should return a zero instead. If I found the variables, I should return a one instead. And if I find a plus, I should return a plus of the derivative of the children. Oh, wait. Looks like the evaluation stuff again. When I find the multiply, you do the funky stuff with the multiplied derivatives. When you have the divisions, you do the even more funky stuff with the derivatives. Uh, uh, of the division and so on and so on. And what happens when you have the derivatives of cosinus of something? What should you do? Sine. Minus. 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 Okay, well, we look at it right now. It works, but it has one problem. What happens if I compute, well, log. no, wait. Yeah, first, <laughs> or exponent, or what, no, no, log is, is the worst. Log. Yeah, log is the worst. Uh, we have something, what, what we, we, we get after we call derivatives? We have a new expression, tree, with plus, variable tags of n, and constant. Oh, wait, it match analytical function. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This means that I can call the derivatives of my stuff and just pass in some values and hopla, I'm evaluating the numerical value of my analytical derivatives. Dang. But wait, 
if my derivative is actually something that matches an identical function, this means I call, call derivative again on it, and so on and so on. So I basically for free get the nth derivative of whatever identical function we have. But it is one problem. What happens if I have x times x times x times x times x ten times, and I take the seventh derivative of that? What would be the size of the abstract syntax tree? In two, two words, fucking huge. <laughs> because basically, every time we have a multiply, we spawn something which is binary. And we do it again because we have this multiply of multiply of multiply. And we do it seven times. So we should end up with something like 2 at the power of 17 nodes. I think the compiler would die far before. So it works. But don't use this in production, people. Okay, It's not meant to. What we need, but well, we don't have time anyway, but you could think about that. What we should do is basically, I got a derivative, I call some simplification transform before, and then I copy the derivative again. And every time I do this, I'm trying to keep down the number of stuff. It also means that we may need to have Poe functions that take the power as a template parameters, so we can turn x times x times x times x into Poe of n of x which has a simple linear derivative, which is n times both n minus 1x. Yes? You could probably do the same thing with plus, too, right? And just turn it into a constant multiplication. Yeah, you can do this. You can do this for plus. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of stuff you can do this. So it's, but it's another transform. It's actually the same stuff to write. You just have trying to find rules. The other stuff you want to do is that you have to do the fancy uh, Derivative of whatever was inside the course times minus the sinus of what was inside the course. But what is that? It's in fact the derivative of the function composition. And when you will have sinus and whatever other function, you don't really want to do this each time. So it should be nice if you can actually express whatever function, whatever, as the composition of both functions on whatever. So you can just call the derivatives of composition automatically. So if you don't have anything to do for the night to come, you can look at that. But how can I write a transform that basically just return me another expression instead of computing a value? Well, so the transform. We will hit a, a tree and we'll generate that's a tree. <laughs> my, my standard question. Yeah. Compile time or runtime? Both again. Compile time we will pass through the transform to select all the parts we need to compute the actual stuff we need to apply. So will you get during compile time when you apply the derivative? Yeah. Will you basically get a new replace it directly by the new you will you will get a new type yeah and what what you will end up is a chain of constructor calls mm -hmm. for the new expression mm -hmm. which will be then again squished by the inline name stuff and when you call the operators it will pass to the other transform that will squish the evaluation and you will have basically all the stuff in line again so how does it look uh, where is it oh come on don't get why it doesn't come back that's strange. Not like that. It's a problem in MPL, actually. It's on MPL? Yeah, so MPL and does not have a value as a member. So MPL and? With. What the heck? I will check that afterwards. Doesn't sound right. So, you can see there is a bit more files. Because I wanted the solution to be as clear as possible by separating the different parts. Okay? So there is a lot of files we already knew. Grammar, which doesn't change. Functions which just contain the definition for cosine and sine. Expression is our analytical expression classes. Evaluate. Okay. And there is terminal which is just the definition for the terminals. And there is two new players. This and that. So let's look at derivative first because it's the most, uh, let's say, what the heck uh, stuff going on. So I'm introducing new stuff again. Proto R has a problem, which is first, it can't have more than eight alternatives. Which means that if you need more, you need to chain R one into the others. And the problem is that R match linearly. It goes down, it's tough, and then it gets stopped. So the more alternatives you have, the more time it takes to compile. And very quickly, it starts to be a real burden on your uh, company time. So Proto provides something which is called Proto Switch. That takes a parameter which is basically something that will act as a set of switch cases if we are writing a regular switches. And this stuff actually do the matching is a big off one. What does it do? It takes the tag of the most topmost expressions, put it there, and jump directly into whatever 
specialization of this class he found. And this is glucosal. It can be actually specialized externally from the first classes. So you can have a very small graph <coughs> that your user can actually expand from the outside. And this is very interesting for some kind of library. You want your user to be able to specify some stuff. Just as a yeah, fill whatever stuff is there with whatever you want to do with whatever. So what do we do? We say, okay, when I derive something, I'm using the derivative, derivative case is in my switch, and I go over there. Usually the first case is say, I don't match anything if you don't tell me to match something. So we prevent error by saying, no, no way to do this. And afterward, what do we do? Yeah, we do this. What happens if I match a terminal? Well, if I match a terminal, and it's a terminal of whatever, and this stuff is true, which means if the value, the type of the value inside my terminal is convertible to double, which means it's double float in, oh wait, it's a tree stuff we had before. It's pushing to one. So if I have a terminal that contains something which is converted to double, then give me a zero. We will look at constant a bit afterwards. And look again. Fancy parents. But what we want to do this time, it's not calling a function. It's actually building an object of type constant zero. So when we look at constant, you will see that it doesn't have any product kernel stuff. I'm just an object. Build me when you match this. So when I match a terminal where the value is compatible to double, give me a zero. The derivative of x plus 3 is 1. The tree disappears. What's going on afterwards? I will go on this afterwards. And you will see why we did this. You will see. And now, hey, to start before, what was the time of, of our variable terminal? It was expression of terminals of variable type of whatever. But then, hey, what? Why is this stuff there and not in the terminal stuff? Well, there is another way to specify terminals in program. Okay, when you take unary minus, how many arguments does it need? One, it's an unary expression. When you take plus, it needs two, it's a binary expression. How many arguments do you need to evaluate a terminal? Zero, so it's an unary expression. And so we have this, which is called neural expression, which can take a special tag of your liking, and whatever value inside. And what is both terminal, in, uh, proto terminal in fact? It's a type def of both neural x, terminal, whatever. So this is what is behind the terminal stuff. And why do we do, we do this? Well, we do this because now we can match variable type directly because it's a special type in the special cases of neural expression. So we don't have to clutter this into the terminal matches over here. And we know that we can, describe, we can discriminate constant terminal from variable terminal just by looking at the tag. This is something that comes very useful at some point. So this is a bit more complex. Okay, what's the derivative of x? What? Always? No. When this is not? If well, if I derive by, the, if I derive by the, y, it's y, zero. <laughs> it's what if I derive x by x? If I don't derive, if I don't make my derivative by the, by the variable I actually have it, it's zero. So what do we do? What is basically what we say there? Okay, I have a neural expression which is a variable. If my value, which is a variable I, I found, is the same type of the value which is stored in the state, and what will be the state, the variable we want to derive across. Okay, this means I'm, I'm taking the derivative of x with respect to x. Well, then I'm returning constant of 1. Or if not, I'm returning a 0. And look, in fact, it's all fit in the f. 
So if can be this, so you just want to test, but you can have a then and a else. So if this stuff is true, do this, else do that. Quite naturally, in fact. And if somewhere, I wait some kind of alternatives. And it's basically two lines to get the multiple derivatives done. It is, am I derivating towards the same variables? If yes, it's one, so it's zero. One, two, three, four, five, six lines. And then, well, what's going on if I'm taking the derivative of unary minus? Well, it's a unary minus for the derivatives. Uh, it is, yes, it is. So there is a new player again. So what's the state in this case? State would be a terminal, which is a vari the variable I want to derivate from. So I would do derivative of some expressions, comma, x. Okay. Means I want to right. take the derivative of this with respect to x. But if you want to evaluate this derivative of, let's say, 1 or three, Oh, you can say derivative of whatever of x, your stuff, 1. Point. Because what does derivative give us? It gives us an analytical expression. What does analytical expression have? Function call operators that takes the mean call value to evaluate. And basically, derivative of whatever of x of 1, we call evaluate on the derivative of your expression with respect to x. We we'll get to there afterwards. So, what's in the state? The state is the terminal that contains the variable we want to derive across. And so, what do I do with this? Functional make negates. Guess what does it do? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, uh, so, but, but state uh, is. How do you check that the state is correct? That, that it it's actually x or y and oh, not 1? Currently, or? I don't. We should have something. Ah, okay. Basically, we should have something like uh, in the derivative function, have something like uh, Bruce Proto asset matches mm. stuff with terminal of whatever. Just to be sure we don't try to derive uh, with respect to cosinus of what or stuff like that. Yeah, we should do this. I didn't do it there. But okay. yeah, you can just I use magic. It was just miraculously no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's full of magic, but not that much. So uh, uh, what do you think this does? It basically creates a new expression using negates and every the stuff I embed inside. So this creates a new node which is a node which is a minus over this. And look, what is it? Well, I'm taking the original child from my negate stuff. And I take its derivatives. And wait, I don't specify any state there. But I have a state over there. How does it get passed? Well, it's passed automatically. Every time you put this, Proto puts the state and the data automatically inside. So you don't have to uh, repeat this every time. Okay. And in fact, uh, no, not there. But if you pass something which is your expression, you can have nothing inside, if you want to. So this is how we de derive the gate, and I would go just over a few cases. Okay, plus, it's a plus of the derivative of the children, whatever. Minus, and, okay, what? Well, dreaded multiplies. Well, it's plus of multiply of left times derivative of right, whatever, 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 whatever. It's A times derivative of B plus derivative of A times B. It's quite readable if you are, yeah, yeah. If, you are if you know what you're looking at. Yeah, well. yeah. You know how to read it, it's quite readable. Yeah, I mean, it could be worse. Uh, I'm working on something where you can actually say uh, type of and you just put something like child time stuff. Doesn't quite work because uh, decal type doesn't want to be. But uh, it could be nice if we can actually have some macro where you can actually write some kind of expression using operators. So you don't have to go through this kind of stuff. Well, you will have to use left and right anyway because we need to know uh, what we refer to. But if we can actually write left times derivative of right plus whatever, it could be a bit more readable. So if there is any uh, decal type guru in the room, I'm. Oh, divide is even worse. Maybe if you could overload operators as template names. Yeah. So you have template type T Stuff plus. Like this. Yeah. My, my, my template is That basically was I want to try to do with uh, decal type, but uh, mm -hmm. well. 
So uh, I, I won't go into the details of divide because I don't even remember the formula anyway. <laughs> but it's something like this. I think it's right. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's something like... Yeah. A times the derivative of B minus the derivative of A times B divided by uh, the square of uh, B. Or whatever. <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And, and, go, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Well, so now imagine you came and you have a new function and you want to compute the derivative. You just have to take this, send there, and well, uh, lose a few hair writing this. Not much. Okay. And you get your stuff done. And it's completely extensible from the outside. So you have this for now, but if you have other functions, other rules, you can spawn it up. So basically now, if you want to take this to some kind of usability levels, you can have something that say, okay, every time you make a new, uh, you can have a protocol that every time you make a new function, you have to specialize this evaluation stuff and this derivative stuff. Because if you look at evaluate right now, you will see it's exactly the same in terms of structure. Where is it? Evaluate. <coughs> yeah, fetch variables. And look, evaluate cases and tak, 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 tak. Oh, well, we have this there and the other. Yeah, basically, I, sh I tricks because in this case, I put the default in the general cases. So I don't have to say plus, minus, multiplies, divide. And all the other stuff is basically ended there. And so, why do we have this strange constant tag? Well, look. If I take the derivative of this, what's the tree I get? I get three, which is plus, constant one, constant zero. And if I take the derivative of that, I have to have something that say, oh, what's the derivative of constant n? Which means constant n has to be an expression in cells. And so we have to make it worse with the other stuff. And if you look at constants, and after what I will compile the old stuff just for the gigs, where is content? It's there. Well, what is constant? Well, it's an analytical expression which is in fact a linear expression of constant tag with some impairment inside, which is a value you want to generate as a constant. And what happens when I do this? Well, I have a case is, look at this. It's a switch for the grammar. Even the grammar is now a switch. So I say, yeah, what is this? And you match that, right, you can't get me. And how do I evaluate myself? Well, well. If I match a constant tag, well, get the value. And we play on the fact that m is automatically castable to the integral it, it, it embeds. So this will basically return the game, which will be related with the rest of the stuff. And you guess so, terminals is done the same way with a variable tag there, but the identical function case is there, and some things are returned the value. So all your constants are actually integers? The Currently, yes. <laughs> uh, if you find a way to embed some floating point stuff inside, uh, I will make you a check. <laughs> because, well, yeah, uh, you can make, you, we could make some stuff that basically uh, take, well, you could have something which is actually uh, not tied to the but but as a value, as I said before. So, uh, is, it, is it for really instance? In your derivation, yeah. the constant appears when you... You have something which is not... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but the, the case where we, we need constant to our real is perhaps something uh, exponential of A. Yeah, X. stuff like that. Because we need 1 over... Exponential yeah. of X, A exponential of A X. Yeah. But, uh, well, yes. it has to be extended. And I think, yeah, the first thing we should do is actually having a way to have uh, non-static constant inside. So you can do stuff like this. So you could have a look at derivative afterward if you want, but yeah. So I'm computing the derivative of x plus 6 with respect to x, da 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 da, with respect to, oh come on I cheat, I never use the other one. Well, I will try. And we have the multiple derivatives here. And basically what does this stuff do? It takes a function, apply derivatives and call it, and call derivative of n minus 1 until we end up with the derivative of 1. But you have operator coma, right? No, no, no. Look, there is a trick. This is derivate and not derivate underscore. 
this is a function which had two parameters. I will show you the function. Yeah. Come on. Operator, come on. I'm not like this. Do, do I look like a guy that actually uses operator, come on? Okay, I do. So there is the stuff you, you can actually get. Yeah, function and variables. I'm making the derivates instances and I call it on F and V. And what's the result? Is a result of derivate applied on whatever. Because wait, derivate is a polymorphic function object we build using protoparts. But if it's a polymorphic function object, you can call result of it. And result of applied to a proto transform on something, give you the type, the transform will give you when you call it a time. This gives you the type, this gives you the value. This is the, the mirror between the compact and the runtime. And for derivative of degree, we basically have an helping function there that do the recursions because we are still in all three, so I can get partially a specialized template function. Basically, everybody goes. When I have a one, I'm just calling derivate. And if I have a head, you guess what happens. I'm calling derivate on this, and I'm passing this to derivative of n minus one, so I can keep changing stuff. Which is basically what we should do. So, again, except for the syntactic clutter, it's basically the intent of what we wanted to do. If I have an nth derivative, it's derivative of the nth minus one derivative, which clearly appears there. So, well, how, how much is that? Is that like 10 files or maybe less? One, two, three, four, five, yeah. And we basically have something that, given some work, can basically represent whatever identical functions. We have the relation and we have the multiple derivatives with respect to whatever variables. It's basically, I think, less than 200 lines if we remove all the comments and crap. So, now, try to imagine how much, I mean, the amount of code could have been if you have done this by hand. Uh, at one point, I was really vicious and I did this to my uh, student, okay, in a C++ master degree. And, uh, well, at the time there was no proto, so we were making expression template by hand, and there was an example we had in the end. Uh, and I remember that the best stuff I get was something like a bit less than 2,000 miles. So it's basically 10 times less code to write. And the fact is that every stuff is completely reusable in other cases. I mean, I can take the derivative, well, I can take the derivative function now, okay, and I take whatever uh, matrix code I have in my other tools, which is proto expressions that happens to have plus, minus, and stuff. I write the code using matrices, and pa I can pass it to derivative, and what do I do? Well, I get back something which is basically the derivative of my matrix expressions, and I have nothing to do on the matrix side. Why? Because, well, I just had to add the derivative stuff. Oh, when well, you have a matrix tag, well, it turns the matrices, and that's all I have to do. And I can say, okay, I have this huge matrix expression, I take this and I get the derivatives. Transform a completely domain and expression agnostics. So we can actually uh, take this, we can play around, I think we can actually trick a form of Phoenix function and compute this derivative with that. And it will work. Just by having the small block to say, okay, when you see this coming out from Phoenix stuff, do whatever. And so this fact that we can actually split everything up, and that the fact that the grammar, the expression, and the transformation you can apply in expression. It's completely separated by the uh, design of Proto. Basically, every stuff you write has a DSL in Proto, being a transform or whatever. Well, it's bound to be reused in whatever other project you may have as you Proto again, and it's something that looks like that. And everything is made, so everything is in the operable. If you have two different Proto DSL, and you need to put one into the others, and when the first is the second is coming up, you say, oh yeah, I don't have to do anything on this because this guy knows how to do. I just call whatever the guy needs to be done. And you can have a small basis of DSL based on product, which are all interoperable. So instead of uh, being a mismatch of uh, end rate and stuff for doing expression templates that work or not the same way, or which are compatible or not, we can actually use product as some kind of base framework, build all our DSL on top of this. And the amount of work to make one work with the others is basically ridiculous. And basically, what, well, how I see this, well, I'm, I'm not hearing, so I won't take into, I won't put words in his mouth. 
But in my opinion, basically what Proto achieves that we basically have some kind of well, forgot expression templates. We have a lazy evaluation framework, which makes all lazy evaluation based library, not even the other library, be interoperable if you want to. Well, it makes sense, of course. But basically, it basically frees us of, oh yeah, crap, what I want to do if I want to put this into that and make it work. What with Proto, then I know somewhere there is a grammar I can check if the stuff is coming from there or from there. And maybe I have a couple of transforms I can actually grab and apply to my stuff before sending it to something else. And, well, we did this as an exercise in our own project. Basically, yeah, we have two stuff going different thingy and, well, pouring one into the other, the one way or the other is basically true. You ask through your ass, making the grammar of one of this new about the other one and the other way around, like basically two cases in the proto switch. And done. So, well, for me it's more than just expression template. We really have to look at this as some kind of, yeah, lazy evaluation with big quotes uh, framework. And this is something uh, I think is worth being pursued. So, uh, well, I encourage you trying to play with all this stuff. It should compile. No, no. Well, we try to... No, it doesn't. Okay. It compiled yesterday. Whatever. <laughs> Damn. It should compile for the GitHub so, stuff. Yes. Try tomorrow. Maybe. Uh, I probably found the, the error? reasonable compile error. Yeah. Uh, one, one five oh three. Maybe the reasonable proto max logical reality. Um, oh, I know what is it. I think Eric bought yeah, yeah, the preprocessing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will change that. I will change that. Okay. Well, I encourage you to play with the stuff uh, when it works. Uh, look at the code. Uh, try to put stuff one next to the others. Look at the dock with this kind of few light on the thingy and well, I hope it will actually start to make sense for some of you. And well, next time you have to make something funky with complex systems of trying to do stuff, well, give Proto a try and see if I can solve your problem. So thanks for uh, bearing with me all this time. And uh, well, I didn't kill that much before. <laughs> no, so okay, so well, I have I could have done uh, yeah, 10 percent of flow, so it's okay. So thanks everybody for following this. And if you have any questions.